Bonjour. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today, both in person and virtually for our third annual conference for the French Heritage Corridor. Um, I'm delighted to uh, welcome all of you. I'm Lisa Kahn. I direct the French Heritage Corridor Initiative, uh, which is an initiative of the French Heritage Society's Chicago Midwest chapter. And uh, I see the sea of friendly faces uh, in front of me. I hope you uh, virtually are seeing them on uh, our uh, screen. And, uh, you know, whether you're coming for near or far, we are all one big happy family. And uh, I hope that over the course of today, we will uh, have that opportunity to exchange, to um, communicate with one another, hear what's on uh, various people's minds and learn something and uh, move forward uh, together. Um, before we get started with our program, I do want to say uh, quite a lot of thank yous, some merci's. Uh, first of all, I want to start by saying a big thank you to Drew uh, Hager and his team here at the barn. This is a wonderful venue for us, and we could not be more appreciative for providing this wonderful space for us to hold uh, this conference. And I also want to acknowledge some honored attendees. We have Yannick Tagan, our Consul General uh, de France in the Midwest, uh, who is also um, co-hosting the reception for uh, us this, this afternoon after the conference and providing the delicious champagne. Merci. Um, we also have Jean Lamy Belzine. Uh, where is Jean sitting? There she is. Um, our public and government affairs officer with the Delegation du Quebec à Chicago. And uh, for all of those delicious cookies and the little maple candies you see, uh, those are uh, thanks to, to uh, Jean and her team. We really appreciate that. Uh, as well as um, I want to acknowledge Jennifer Harlan, uh, our FHS, French Heritage Society Executive director who's in the house. So uh, thanks for being here. Um, also, I would like to say a big uh, thank you to our conference sponsors, to the Villa Louis and the Wisconsin Historical Society, to the Prairie du Chien Historical Society, to Travel Wisconsin and the Quebec Delega Delegation um, for their support. Um, I also want to say thank you to uh, FHS's Chicago Midwest sustaining sponsor, and that's Reed Centraccio Law Firm. They're the only uh, family law firm with an affiliated office in Lyon, France. So uh, they're located in Chicago. Another huge thank you to the William T. Kemper Foundation for their ongoing support for the French Heritage Corridor uh, Initiative. And to my dream team, uh, this is an all volunteer based uh, effort, and I want to acknowledge the leadership team for the French Heritage Corridor. We have Seal Miller Boucher, our ambassador from Iowa. She's joining us uh, via Zoom virtually. We have uh, Jim Paul, our ambassador from Illinois, that is here live. Colby Bartlett, our Indiana. Ambassador also uh, joining us virtually. Michael Nassani, our Michigan ambassador here. Rob Mann, where's Rob? There he is back there. Minnesota ambassador. Tandy Thompson also hiding in the back. Missouri ambassador and Mary Lee's Antoine, our Wisconsin ambassador and there she is next to Rob. And uh, again, uh, a co-host. She is from Prairie du Chien and has been instrumental in helping us put all of this together. So a huge thank you to her. I also want to acknowledge um, the rest of our leadership team, Charles mm -hmm. Balassi. There he is. Amy Fienga, who uh, may not be joining us today. She's not feeling 100% and we wish her well. Um, 
we have Diane Hunter. There she is. And Sylvette Nicolini, probably checking in the rest of our uh, attendees. And Mark Rosier, who may not uh, have arrived. Okay. So that's that makes up our team. I also want to uh, say, uh, uh oh, technical difficulties back there. Uh, I also want to acknowledge um, Benjamin Wells, uh, our FHS membership officer in New York, in the FHS office in New York, and uh, our intern, Juliette Petipa. They're uh, going to be assisting, and, and there's the, the main guy, Glenn Kahn, doing, doing his thing, helping in every way. Um, so that that's sort of the 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 thank yous and the the team uh, who I hope all of you will uh, know how much it takes to put these sorts of things on and to keep us going. Uh, it really is a huge uh, a huge effort, and I really do appreciate everybody's contribution. We have uh, some lovely uh, support letters uh, that have come in. I'd like to share with you. Uh, one comes from the mayor of Prairie du Chien, and uh, I'll just read it to you if I may. Um, he said, the city of Prairie du Chien fully supports the French Heritage Corridor, an initiative of French Heritage Society. And uh, he said, our beautiful scenic area has a long history of fur trading and French influence on our history. We have many residents here that trace their heritage all the way back to the early settlements in our town. And he's pleased that we're hosting the event in Prairie du Chien and welcomes all guests and residents to enjoy some history here. So that came from Dave Hemmer, the, the mayor. So we really appreciate those kind words. And I'd also like to share with you um, another letter. This comes from Patrick Joyce, state senator from Illinois. And he wrote, on behalf of the 40th Senate District and the state of Illinois, I would like to welcome the attendees of the French Heritage Corridor third annual conference. While my schedule precludes my attendance, I recognize the importance of acknowledging and celebrating the rich history of the French Heritage Corridor. Last fall, I visited the restored 1837 schoolhouse in the village of Bourbonnais. This impressive project was an ambitious joint venture between the village of Bourbonnais, the Bourbonnais Grove Historical Society, and many other stakeholders and donors. It's a great example of the types of projects highlighted in the French Heritage Corridor that educate the public and the importance of the French presence in the Midwest. I fully support these efforts and recognize that it is critical to keep the history alive for residents of the 40th district, especially children who can visit sites like the 1837 schoolhouse. I wish you the best during the conference and thank you for your continued work in preserving our region's history. Sincerely, Patrick Joyce. So just wanted to share those with you. All right, so let's get down to it. A uh, couple of thoughts to share with all of you. Um, you know, being so close to the river, the Great Lakes and the rivers, um, especially the Mississippi here, they've always been connectors. As far back as 1673, I mean, we are days away from celebrating the 350th anniversary of when Marquette and Juliet and others um, rolled into town, came, came down the Great Lake system, came through the Wisconsin River and entered the Mississippi for the first time, first time Europeans entered. And on Sunday, the 17th of June will be the exact anniversary, 350 years uh, to mark that occasion. And there's another, uh, and, and, I, and I also want to acknowledge with the great help and assistance of Native peoples. So this joint history that we're all working with, you know, this is a very important date. Um, 30 years ago, there's a lot of, you know, threes. 
1973, 1993, um, 30 years ago, a huge flood, one of the worst on record. Um, the Mississippi flooded and Charles Vellacy formed his own crew and mobilized them to help save some French heritage sites in Illinois and Missouri. In fact, I want to point out for those who are here in person, the uh, image you see uh, in the back corner is the Amaro house. And that was uh, exactly what Charles and, and company uh, targeted and saved. It's a very significant site in St. Genevieve, Missouri. Uh, he got the attention, not just of people in the Midwest, but also uh, from across the pond over in France. Princesse Marisol de la Tour d'Auvergne, love that name, the first president of French Heritage Society. He got her attention. So we've been linked for a long time, despite the fact that the Chicago Midwest chapter is only four years old. Our ties run, run a long time. And um, that's something that we can really be proud of and know that that we've been working on these kinds of efforts for a long time. Uh, many though don't realize that that same flood that hit Illinois and Missouri also affected this area in Prairie du Chien. That was, I believe, the fourth worst flood on record. That brings us to 2023. And this past April, another flood here. And this one was even worse than the one in 1993. You'd never know it looking around, but actually we were supposed to be in a different venue, which was flooded, two feet of water. So this is something that is still very much a uh, part of our reality that we've got to work together uh, to you know, deal with these kinds of, of issues. Um, we'll, enjoy an evening cruise this evening on the Mississippi. And, you know, it should kind of bring us all kind of back to that, all of those different moments in time and where we envision where we go uh, forward. But in spite, of, in spite of those challenges, uh, you know, that the waterways can pose, it really brings it out the best in us. And it helps bind us together instead of looking at these states as boundaries, we're really joined by our waterways. You know, from the oceans, the Great Lakes, the river system, coursing through North America and really at the heart of, you know, our country and who we are. Um, as a network, the French Heritage Corridor, we are strong and we're growing stronger. We have hundreds of stakeholders. And when problems arise, the French Heritage Corridor Network, we bind together and we help one another and we find solutions. But we're also now strong enough after our first three years to be proactive. So we don't have to be in a reactive mode, always you know, trying to scramble and help fix something or save something. We can do that in a very planned kind of fashion. And, um, we have a, a bright future protecting and celebrating our shared past. So I think that's something that we should really hold on to and in our thoughts as we move forward. Um, so today, as we've joined together, we're primed to explore today that shared history and our potential. And we have so many opportunities to build. We could do this in education, the tourism sector, historic and cultural preservation, and in our ties of friendship, l'amitié. So mm -hmm. we're gonna be discussing today all kinds of topics, anything from how FHS grant giving works and how that can be accessed in the corridor. Franco-American educational exchange, how we can help our FHC stakeholders, public outreach through our 
FHC webpage, which is now very uh, mobile friendly, and using the interactive map and our calendar of events and our new history modules, which we will launch earlier or later, earlier, later today, this afternoon. So during our AM session, our morning session, we're gonna give the spotlight to Wisconsin and Iowa because the Mississippi River on either side, you know, we're just a hop, skip and a jump from Iowa. So we have both states very well represented this morning. And then in the afternoon, that's gonna allow us to kind of pull back and uh, really um, look in the more broadest sense how the FHC uh, you know, can, can uh, operate and how we can consider it. So we're gonna make time for discussions in both the afternoon and morning sessions that we will then give you virtual attendees that opportunity to join the group. At that time, you can unmute and feel free to, whether you wanna raise your hand and give us a question in the chat, or if you would like to, you know, just go ahead and ask it and, and join the group as if you were, you were really here. And we encourage everyone in person to do the same. And uh, let's, let's see where our pre presentations and our different thoughts take us and what we'd like to uh, discuss. We will um, also take a break at the end of this morning session to, for the virtual uh, attendees, have some breakout rooms where you'll have the opportunity to meet with our Iowa and our Indiana ambassadors and uh, you know ask questions, learn a little bit more about what they uh, can tell you and what they're all about. And those in person will take a half an hour and you'll visit the, the tables from our ambassadors and leadership team members. So uh, that will be from noon to 1230. We'll take our lunch break and come back at 2 p.m. Central Standard Time. So all you virtual people, don't forget about us in the afternoon because there's a lot of exciting stuff happening then. All right. So. As we uh, move towards our program now, you've heard me quite enough. Um, I would like to uh, say that, you know, in addition to geographic, scientific, historical evidence to, that shapes our understanding of the area uh, and our shared history, it's, it's vital that we also include linguistics folklore, oral history traditions in our, in, in what's important to help us understand and know these things more deeply. Um, you know, the French Heritage Corridor can help also dispel that common misconception that Native American tribes are extinct. Rather, they're very much alive and these voices should be heard. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Albert Lebeau, who is a member of the Lakota people and the cultural resources program manager at Effigy Mounds National Monument in Harpers Ferry, Iowa. And he will uh, talk to us for about 15 minutes and uh, we'll have time for questions later during our uh, our discussion session. So I'm gonna turn it over to Albert, come on over. Thank you, Albert. You bet. Um, good morning, my name is Albert Lebeau. Um, what I just said was uh, the greeting in my language, which is Lakota. Um, and basically I said good morning and who I was. So good morning, my name is Albert Lebeau. Uh, and today I'm gonna talk about um, 
kind of the prehistory of the Mississippi River, people who were on it, and then to about 1673, when we had um, Marquet and Joliet come up and be here. Um, so I work at Effigy Mounds National Monument. Our mounds there um, are burial mounds. We consider them burial mounds. And they are roughly 2,000 years old-ish. And the number one question we always get from our visitors who come to the park is, what tribes built the mounds or who built the mounds? What tribes built the mounds? And there's no real easy answer to that question because the tribes that we work with today and Effigy Mounds works with 19 different tribes um, weren't the same tribes as the ones who built the mounds per se. You have to remember that 2000 years ago, the tribes identified themselves as the people. So, my Kochung, um, people of the big voice. Um, my people, Pate Oyate, which is people of the buffalo. The people, there, there were the people. Um, and the people on the other side of the river were the other people. Um, and so as cultures evolved and um, outside influences influenced um, the tribes and with the um, the introduction of, of um, foreign melodies, uh, you know, in reductions in a population and growths of populations, you had these groups trying to break out. Um, one of the cool things about this particular area is that um, we can define it by linguistics. And so, out of the 19 different tri tri tribal nations that we work with, you know, um, 16 are related by linguistics um, to the Siouan uh, dialect, which is great because I'm Lakota and Sioux, so I think it's awesome, an awesome deal. So anything that says Siouan, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. So, um, so yeah, and so people were using this area. Um, kind of a, like a neutral zone. Um, this was a very special place to a lot of tribe, to the tribes that were here um, because he had the confluence of the Wisconsin River and he had the, and obviously the Mississippi River and then the Yellow River. Um, and so this area was really considered a special location, hence why the mounds were being built on the Iowa side, not on the, as much as on the Wisconsin side. That and the fact that the Wisconsin side, the bluffs are pretty far away from the river, um, at that, even at that particular time. Um, and so people coming to a cemetery, you don't wanna, you don't wanna live in a cemetery. You don't wanna, you know, have a war in a cemetery. You don't want to, you know, grow food in a cemetery. I, mean, I wouldn't, but, so that's why we don't see a whole lot of these huge villages as we would see along other parts of the river. Um, and that's, that's the way it was, you know, um, ebbs and flows of population, you know, sometimes you had good years, sometimes you had bad years, you know, starting from the paleo Indian period from about 10,000 years ish, all the way through the woodland where, you know, this is where we see the pottery and all the, the cool things. <laughs> um, and people were just learning new, new things and new uh, technologies and adapting to them. Uh, for this area, one of the most definite and definable um, transitions was the Oonota culture. And from an archeological point of view, that's a misnomer. Uh, Oonota is not a culture. Oonota is a pot. But because this pot in the way they were making it was um, easier easier than the way they were making their pots before, they um, people started adapting this way. Um, and so archaeologists love to give names to stuff like that. I'm an archaeologist too, by the way. So I totally get it. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so you had all these, you had changes in culture, you had changes in self-identification, you know, all through this before 1673. 1673, and actually about 1600, probably the 1500s, you saw this push of European things coming west. Um, and, you know, you started seeing metal, you started seeing um, horses, you started seeing um, disease all coming west before, you know, the, the, the non-natives showed up. No, officially. So that's where we get to Jalier and Marquette. Um, and I always say, and one of my one of my uh, friends used to tease me a lot about it, but I always used to say Jalier and the other guy. And the reason I say that is because you know, Mar uh, Father Marquette was um, he was the original Black Robe. Um, he was the one who brought, who introduced, and brought. Um, Christianity through the Jesuit order to um, to the tribes here, um, and that was in in the opinion of some tribal members, is was when um, we started to be conquered, and there's not a lot of again some tribes. There's not a lot of happiness that goes along with with Marquette, um, our jolly for that matter. But um, it is what it is. And the good thing about all this is that, yes, it did introduce another foreign culture, but the adaptations to that from those first um, interactions with um, with Father Marquette to where we see ourselves today um, is really, really interesting. Um, and so, you know, from all the way from creation stories within tribal folks to, um, I think I was baptized a Christian. I don't consider myself a Christian, but I was baptized a Christian, um, uh, Episcopalian. So, it, yeah. <laughs> and, and um, you know, it's it became part of the culture. You know, so Christianity through the the through Marquette provided another option for some tribal people. Um, the other good thing about this was when they came up and they found, you know, people here. I think they discovered people here, and people are already here. But anyway, <laughs> um, started started the fur trade. You know, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, for the beaver, it might have been a little bit of a bad thing, but ultimately, you know, you saw French fur traders coming in, you saw French mountain men coming in, and how the French treated Native Americans was 180 degrees different than what the British and the Spanish were doing, and later on, the Americans. What the French did was went native, quote unquote. They saw these people as people, generally speaking. And so that's why you get a name like LeBeau. You know, my ancestor was a Frenchman. You know, that's where my name came from. You know, uh, he married our, I guess he married one of my great, 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 great grandmothers. Um, and that's where that line comes from. Um, and we see that all through Indian country, even today, you have Le Comps, you have um, the Corregs, you have, I mean, there's a lot of French and Indian country up here in northern, in the northern plains and um, the north, uh, eastern woodlands. Um, and that's because French fur traders. Um, and so, on one end, a person could be upset that this happened. But on the other hand, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that. And so looking at it and taking a, a, a wider point of view is for us 
in Indian country is like, yes, it is what it is. It's part of who we are. And, you know, we accept it. Um, I joke around at home. I'm from Shine River um, Indian Reservation in North Central South Dakota. And I'm literally related to half my tribe, literally blood related. Um, if we, I, when people ask me about my last name, I say the Lebeau's are like Johnson's and Smith's in Indian country because they are. I mean, they were very, he was very prolific and his children were very prolific. So, um, but, you know, I mean, that's, you know, I'm literally related, blood related to half my, my tribe. And the other half I'm adopted into. So, you know, it kind of makes you know, me dating in high school kind of hard. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, but with all that stuff, you know, so you had, you had, you know, this, the daily struggles prior to contact. And then after contact, you had the cultures adjusting back to a new normal. The new normal was having these non-natives being present. What the French did was instead of creating the, creating the huge differences, they brought the na natives in and treated them as, again, human. Um, it wasn't until the 1800s or mid 1800s did the United States government actually say that tribal people were human. Um, and that's a Ponca case from um, Nebraska, uh, Standing Bear case, if everyone wants to look at it, look that up. But um, that's where the court said, yeah, you are a human. And that was in the late 1800s. So, and uh, those were the, so yeah, so that was, that was the, um, that was a change, you know, in looking at how tribal people interacted with these newcomers. Um, again, we made, we, made, um, we made treaties with the crown, um, both French and British, um, the czar in Russia as well. Um, and then of course the United States. Um, the United States, were like the British. They didn't want, they wanted us out of the way um, because all this land and a bunch of other issues that go along with that. Um, but the French, not so much. And as I think, and as I was thinking about this presentation today, I was thinking, what were the benefits? And they had a lot of benefits. The bringing of, the bringing of, you know, trade goods, you know, cloth, you know, um, was you see that that culture change in 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 the in the history of of Indian country? One of the things that I'm interested in is actually the time after French contact, but is looking at a, a 50 year time period between 1890 and 1940. You know, you go from oh, you go from <laughs> you go from um, moccasins to bobby socks within a generation. You know, how interesting is that to see that in the archaeological record and the historical record, where you had people surviving Wounded Knee in the Wounded Knee Massacre, then their children going to basketball games. You know, how interesting is that? How cool is that? And that's one of the things that really led me into this, into the, the field I'm in. And one of the reasons why I work for the National Park Service. The National Park Service. Our goal is to tell the entire story, not just bits and pieces, not, you know, we tell the good, the bad, the ugly, but it's our job to ensure that the American people get the whole story. So I hope I didn't go too fast. <laughs> Thank you, Albert. You were worried about going over, you were spot on. I mean, perfect. I really appreciate what you had to say and share with all of us. Uh, and I also um, am very happy to count effigy mounds 
uh, National Monument as one of the French Heritage Corridor stakeholders that you can find on our interactive map on our website and learn much more about it and hopefully go visit and learn more doing so. Go say hello to Albert when you're there. Um, our next speaker, Ryan Howell, will complement what Albert has shared with us um, and dive deeper into the material culture um, and share with us uh, his archaeological findings and research and knowledge uh, and a slightly different perspective, of course, but uh, I know it will be uh, very enriching. So I invite him to join us and um, there he is. Uh, I'm like, where do you go? Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and uh, we'll uh, listen to uh, what Ryan has to share with us. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. So where do we have slides here? Okay. All right. So uh, actually my perspective is, is gonna build off of uh, Albert's quite a bit. Um, I'm not necessarily a fur trade archeologist, I'm a generalist and I spend most of my time working on Native American sites. Up, up a little bit higher, okay. voice higher, okay. Um, and uh, my perspective is that uh, although we're talking about the French heritage and the, and the French influences on Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin was a Native American place that got French uh, entree posing. Um, although we talk about kind of in the mainstream history, uh, we talk about kind of the 1600s come in, the 1634, 1673, and now we have French Wisconsin, and British Wisconsin, and American Wisconsin. In reality, Native Americans could control Wisconsin well into the 1840s. And so um, what we're talking about here is, is, is a very small bunch of uh, colonial traders working within the systems and as Albert said, the culture of, uh, of native Wisconsin. And uh, I think that's where uh, my perspective lies. So uh, I know, I'm aware that's Fort St. Charles, so no one from Illinois shoot me, but uh, go from there. So uh, French colonial Wisconsin, it, it's typically a design uh, marketed in time from 1634 which is the first diplomatic voyage of uh, Jean Nicolet um, to about 1763 with the Treaty of Paris. Um, you can see the French influence all over Wisconsin. Um, Prairie Shane here is a great example, a, a French community that was laid out with long lots like you see there on the right. Uh, we still have French structures, which Mary will talk about uh, following this. Uh, French artifacts are found throughout archeological sites in Wisconsin. And the French people um, are still very much part of uh, Wisconsin today, especially in the Native American communities. Uh, on the person on the left there is uh, Augustine Grignon. He's kind of considered the founder of Green Bay. And if you deal with anybody in the Menominee Nation right now, you'll find about 30% of them have the last name Grignon. So like Albert was saying, those, uh, those traditions run deep in tribal Wisconsin. So we'll talk a little bit about French colonial historiography and versus French colonial archaeology. Um, you know, Wisconsin is not at the heartland of uh, of New France. It's it's really out on the edge of the of the uh, trading empire. You've got the Jesuit chronicles, of course. Uh, you've got a few um, governmental letters, uh, things like that. But most of what we've got out here, a few journals. Uh, there's a Marin journal from the 1750s that talks about fur trade in Prairie du Chien. Um, but most of what we found out here is, is from archeology. span And archeology span really adds two things. One, um, it can pick up on and add to that uh, historical record, which is, is pretty minimal uh, for especially the early period. And late, uh, secondly, it deals with the dealings of common people. You know, history is written by the victors, but it's also written by the, the leadership cast in any society. And so if you want to deal with how the fur traders down there, the, the habitants, the voyageurs, the curie de bois um, are living, the archaeology can really reflect that. Uh, those people don't show up as much in the, in the written record. 
So what am I going to talk about? Uh, I started drafting up my notes for this. Uh, uh, figured out later that I had a six-hour talk, and that Lisa probably wasn't going to let me get away with that. So I'm going to have to keep it pretty short. Um, uh, this slide here, uh, this is Peter Pond, the worst speller in Wisconsin history, uh, describing even in 1773, uh, the goings on of, of, of fur trades at Prairie du Chien. Uh, one thing interesting about Prairie du Chien is it seems to have always been kind of a rendezvous area. Um, even in the Native American era, uh, pre-contact era, there aren't these big, uh, like Albert said, Oneota villages, as archaeologists call them, or Mississippian villages. Um, it seems to have always been kind of a neutral ground. And so the fur trade that was going on here at Prairie du Chien may have pre-contact Native American origins. And that's something we see at a lot of places in Wisconsin and the upper Midwest, where essentially the French are grafting on to these pre-contact Native American concepts. Again, like Albert said, they did it best of everybody. Uh, you know, I consult with a lot of Native Americans too, as, as Albert does as a federal agency, I've got 36. Uh, and an Ojibwe elder told me one, the best that always rings for me, said that the French understood and worked with us and they were only interested in trade. They saw us as customers. The English wanted to control the land and, and use us as soldiers. And the Americans just wanted everything. And I think that's basically it. Um, so we're gonna go over geography. And, and again, we're talking about, as Lisa said, the waterways and the corridors, you know, I mean, really when we're talking about a, a French heritage corridor here, we're talking about the rivers and the transportation corridors, because essentially everything in Wisconsin moved by canoe um, at that time during the French fur trade. So the waterways are critical. And those were the corridors of culture and the corridors of, uh, of uh, uh, trade, but they were also, uh, whoop, it went everywhere. Um, they were also, again, pre-contact trade routes. You know, when you look at the earliest maps of Wisconsin during the French period, not only are they using Native American names, a lot of times it's pretty clear that they're being drafted and informed by Native American knowledge of the landscape. And so I think you really cannot separate, especially the early French travel, um, from the Native American trade that was already going on. As we get into the, to the timeline, you'll see that actually the first fur traders out here were not the French. They were the Ottawa, the Huron, the Wyandotte who were out here trading and it was the French who jumped onto those routes that were already in place. We'll go through a timeline of French Wisconsin very briefly. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about site types and artifacts. And uh, then we'll talk about the French, uh, Wisconsin French heritage post 1763 because I really think that's an artificial uh, boundary. Um, you talk about uh, especially in places like Prairie du Chien and Green Bay, uh, the voyageurs here, the, the, the Métis communities, these were the folks that were working for the British, working for the Americans, and basically continued the fur trade well into the 1820s um, until the lead trade took over uh, from the system. And then they just moved west. They became the Red River communities. They became the Rocky Mountain fur trade communities. Um, essentially, they never left. They were just basically uh, subsumed uh, by larger management companies, essentially hostile takeovers. So we'll go from there. So if we look at uh, the geography of Wisconsin, we've got basically four main entrance routes. Uh, the Wisconsin Fox corridor coming down through Green Bay there, um, which runs, uh, was probably the primary corridor. Um, and that basically allowed you to access uh, central Wisconsin. You had the northern corridor along the south shore of, of, uh, of uh, Lake Superior, Gumi, and that allowed you to access basically Madeline Island, Schwamigan Bay uh, community, which was essentially the Anishinaabe uh, communities by the time most of this came in. Earlier, it was the, the Dakota, uh, especially the Asante Dakota, but by the 1700s, it was pretty much the Anishinaabe headquarters, and so that was the trade coming out of there. And by a portage through the Brule and St. Croix River, you could then get access to the upper Mississippi and the Minnesota country. And you could also get there from the Wisconsin uh, Fox River, or you could come up um, through the Chicago and the Illinois and up through New Orleans and Louisiana, up the Mississippi, of course. Um, but that Western cluster of forts that you see there is essentially targeting the Dakota. 
they're going after buffalo hides and they're going after furs from the Dakota there. And they're trading firearms uh, to the Dakota. That's the main, main trade off there. But you see basically those three clusters, Green Bay and the Fox River in one circle in, in the east, uh, La Pointe and Schwamigan Bay to the north, and then essentially what you can call the, the Mississippi River forts uh, along the Mississippi River there. Prairie du Chien could fall into that, but Prairie du Chien is always kind of an outlier. It was always a little bit more associated with the Illinois country, um, but uh, could probably fall into that same group. And again, that idea that each of these is serving a, a Native American community. So these are small settlements of probably only a hundred or a couple hundred people that are serving much larger Native American communities, essentially as the Walmarts of their day. In fact, the largest hardware store we have in Wisconsin is called Menards, and uh, they're, they're still doing a, a brisk business as uh, traders today. So, but anyway, uh, the Green Bay Fox River community is servicing the Menominee, the Ho-Chunk, and the Sauk and the Meskwaki. Chwamagan Bay, like I said, the Anishinaabe or the Ojibwe, you might know them as the Chippewa, and the Mississippi River posts are, are servicing the Dakota and the Iowa. And so that's kind of the way I look at, at Wisconsin's fur trade. It's essentially French service areas on native Wisconsin. Let's go from there. So we look at the timeline of, uh, of French Wisconsin. Uh, as Albert said, a disease is actually probably the first trade product. Um, it comes in about 1520 to 1600. And we can actually track this archaeologically villages that had several thousand people uh, crash within a generation down to 100 or 200 people. It's estimated that Wisconsin probably lost somewhere between 80 and 95% of its indigenous people um, prior to the first French person actually physically stepping onto, onto Wisconsin soil. Uh, that may have been coming up from the Spanish, that may have been coming up from the St. Lawrence. Uh, vectoring that is a little hard to do, but the, the Native American communities that the French met were not the Native American communities that had been here for thousands of years. They were essentially the survivors of, a, of an epidemic um, of an unfathomable scale. I mean, it's a black death of black plague event, essentially is what you're having. And you can imagine the cultural aftermath that that leaves uh, after that. So between about, so we have Quebec founded about 1608, a uh, trade immediately starts essentially from the Huron and the Ottawa uh, being the middlemen. And this is something you'll see in Native American fur trade uh, 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 politics in Wisconsin. The, the position that Native Americans always want to have is to be the middlemen. They want to get the products from the French and then up price to the next tribe to the West. And so uh, uh, this is something that every tribe is trying to do. And there'll be fights between the tribes trying to get this. And uh, eventually you'll have an out outright war uh, with the French and the Fox over trying to control this. Um, so we've got the Marquette uh, Joliet exp expedition. Again, that blue line, the French period, that's kind of the commonly thought, but you can really start to talk about French influence from 1600 to 1830, I think, in Wisconsin. The first uh, cluster of forts comes in about the 1680s. That's gonna be the LaSalle's down in Illinois uh, country. That's Perot and on the Mississippi River here. Uh, the first settlements at La Pointe, the first settlements at, at La Bay or Green Bay. And then you have uh, uh, several withdrawals where the French are pulling their um, military forces and their, their licensed traders back to the St. Lawrence uh, as a result of King William's War and some of the other British um, and French conflicts. Um, but also during this period, you have the, the Curie de Bois, you have the, the runners of the woods basically the unlicensed traders. We know that by 1680, there were 600 of those running around in the Great Lakes. And probably that number got higher and higher. Those probably folks probably did not go back home. And so that fur trade kept going strong. And these are the folks that adapted. They married into the tribal communities. Um, they understood the reciprocal nation, nature of give and take giving that was part of native culture. They understood that to be part of a Native American tribe, kinship was important. You had to have, be somebody, you had to be related to somebody. And so they intentionally followed Native American customs and married in to the tribes that they were dealing with. Um, some of that may have been just, you know, a, a, a uh, kind of uh, economic choice, but also it, it we resulted in a, a large petite community in Wisconsin. 
especially in Prairie du Chien and Green Bay and other places. Um, we have a, a basically we have an aberration of the, the Fox War, which is really an odd one for the French. Um, 1712 uh, to 1716 is the first one. Then you have another one in the 1720s. The Fox are located, if we look over at the, the right, they're located on the Fox River uh, on Lake Winnebago on what becomes Lake Butamore, uh, the Hill of Death because essentially there's a massive battle there and the French are actually rowing artillery in from Montreal to shell the Fox villages. Um, again, the French always seem to do the, the best at working with Native Americans, but for some reason, the Fox and the French just could never see eye to eye. And the Fox were trying to essentially tax the French going down the Fox or Wisconsin Riverway. Um, so essentially they were asking for half. And they were trying to prevent firearms from getting to their traditional enemies, the Dakota. Um, and the French started going around that to the north and to the south, but eventually they decided that they were actually going to declare war and try and annihilate the Fox. And they failed. Um, it was fought to a stalemate. They, they, they slaughtered a lot of the Fox at, at some of these sites, but uh, the last excavation, the last attempt to, to nail the last band of, of Fox actually was repelled by an alliance of the Iowa, the Sauk, and the Fox in Iowa, um, and killed every French soldier to the man. And the Fox to this day apparently have a, his rapier and the French flag in their war bundle. So much is the enemy of this that uh, when the Fox volunteered for World War I, they were highly upset that they were going to go and fight for the French. And they asked to be sent to different theaters. So you're talking about a 300-year grudge that's still going strong between the Meskwaki and the uh, and the French. Uh, second period comes out, and this is where you get your larger forts, um, not the Fort de Chart size, not the Fort Michelin-Mackinac size, but uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 year permanent forts uh, located along the Mississippi River and in some of those other areas. And then of course you have the, the, French, uh, the French and Indian War as we call it here in the United States, um, ending with the French political and economic control of this area transferring to the British. But again, the French community, the French people, the French culture lingers on well into the 1830s and 40s and is never really subsumed until, you got two minutes? Oh boy, better keep going. So um, nice Jesuit rings. <laughs> And then uh, one of the best sites, actually, if we want to talk about archaeology for Wisconsin, is actually found in Texas, the LaBelle shipwreck, uh, which is La LaSalle ship. That's basically revolutionized our understanding of, uh, of uh, French material culture in the 1680s and the 1690s. And the most sought after French fur trade site in Wisconsin for archaeology is the Griffin shipwreck, which uh, wrecked off of uh, Rock Island, which is essentially off of Green Bay. Uh, in 16, uh, 1692, um, and that would be basically the best fur, fur trade archaeological site we could find in the Great Lakes. So again, site types that you can find in Wisconsin, you're going to have the French habitat settlements, uh, Prairie du Chien and, and Green Bay, isolated artifacts. You know, the, the one thing a lot of this is, who are we dealing with when we find these French artifacts? Are we dealing with native communities? Or are we dealing with fur de bois? Are we dealing with Matisse communities? They're all living the same lifestyle. So even though we find French artifacts, are we dealing with a French site, a native site, a mix of the two? A lot of times the French were living in the native communities. So that's an issue. And then fur trade posts and forts. Uh, this is actually Prairie du Chien. There's actually a 1750s fort about five miles down the road here um, that we're trying to get access to right now. Thanks, Tom. So when is a fort not a fort? Uh, again, you know, Fort Sharp, Fort Mich Michelin-Mackinac. A lot of the early maps of Wisconsin show uh, uh, these large kind of, you know, castellated French uh, forts. What we're really talking about is a couple of buildings with a picket fence around. Um, that's, that's what a French fur trade fort looks like in Wisconsin. I guess I'll have to, to, to yield from there then. Okay, okay. <laughs> Again, I could have gone six hours on this. So, 
if you want to learn more, at, learn more, ask, ask me after the uh, the presentations. But Mary's got some great stuff to talk about. Too. So Ryan did not get the hook. We we just uh, will uh, hopefully engage one another and ask questions a little bit later. But um, you know what's amazing is. It, it's it been so helpful to listen to you, Ryan, because you help us see the absolute complexities of this shared history. Uh, it is, I don't want to say a messy business, but it is complex. And for me, the deeper I dive, it, it the juicier it gets. It's, it's just fascinating. And being able to understand it um, in layman's terms, using your Walmart uh, I love it because that is accessible and making something so complex and so far away in many ways accessible like that is at the heart of what we in the French Heritage Corridor Initiative are trying to do. This should be um, breaking out of specialized uh, kinds of uh, approaches to history and to understanding ourselves and our places. Uh, and this is so helpful. So um, I love that you have six more hours in you. You're you're a marathoner, and that just goes to show that there is it's it's so rich, and uh, you very much demonstrated that. Thank you. Our next speaker is our uh, Wisconsin ambassador for the uh, French Heritage Corridor Initiative who is a resident of Prairie du Chien and who has helped me personally understand and appreciate these wonderful structures that still exist. Some things that uh, places that I would have driven right by and missed um, and to understand again that the, there's complex stories and that there's important stewards who are still caring for these places and what they have um, discovered in their own journeys as stewards of these uh, homes, as, of these places, cemeteries, that there is um, another reminder to me that it's everywhere I've gone in the in the French Heritage Corridor, whether it's to the Prairie du Rocher, Prairie du Rocher community in Illinois, uh, or to Wisconsin, to Peoria, to to all kinds of other areas. That same caring and really taking a personal uh, approach, that passion, it's really there. It's not, it's not something you put on and then you, you know, take the costume off and you go about your business. This is everyone's daily uh, experience. And that is something that's so authentic, so genuine that I, I really, really value and appreciate. And I'm so grateful for Mary Elise to have um, joined this group and shared with us what she, her vast knowledge base. And um, I'm just delighted to introduce her now. Um, before she speaks, we have a really great video that uh, she and her team have created uh, as a result of what happened in late April of this year. So um, as she comes up, you'll uh, please watch please the watch video. The video. It's Friday, April 28th, 2023, and uh, the flood has crested today, Mississippi River at 23 feet. Everything at the Villa Louis is good. It's in great shape. No water got in the house. In fact, there's still part of the mound exposed and little water in the basement, but everything is fine. We have air circulation going on, so there's no mold, there's not gonna be any problems with the collections, the paint, the wallpaper, anything like that. And um, same is true of Brisbane House. No water there uh, on the main floor of the house, which is nice, because we just fixed it all up so that we can have it open to the public this summer. We have a recovery team that's gonna take care of all of the buildings for us to clean up because we do have water in a majority of our buildings and the basements. There's a little bit in the mansion, but the collection is safe, high and dry. This boy collection there is safe, high and dry. But the fur trade, um, unfortunately that has 
nearly two feet of water on the first floor. So we're not quite sure the status of that once we get in there, but we are working closely with our team out of Madison. We've had facilities folks deployed the last couple weeks and we're monitoring it daily. We have people out here. So it's just life on the river. We are prepared. Um, we are hopeful that we wouldn't have flooding this year, but unfortunately we do. We do need for the island to open back up and that has to be below 19 feet. And so it's quite a process to watch and work with the city to make sure the roads are safe once this historic third highest crest goes back down. So we're looking forward to dry days like this, hopefully not a lot of rain, so we can get back to business and open up for our guests for 2023. Welcome to life on the river. <laughs> but as both of our uh, previous speakers have said, the river is so much a part of the history and it has brought us all together for thousands of years. Okay. So I termed my talk, Wisconsin after the French left. And I suppose I should define that. Um, it's after the French government or any form of French government left. But the French per se never left what is now Wisconsin. But the, the culture that remained, again, as our previous uh, speakers mentioned, was a mixed culture. A lot of the people spoke French. They may have been of French ancestry, they may have been a British ancestry, they may have been of one of the tribal ancestors. And French was very much the common language in Wisconsin until the uh, 1820s, 30s, when the Americans uh, discovered us. And um, so what we preserve and interpret is a distinct French culture of the upper Mississippi far different from the French culture of the lower Mississippi or of even the middle Mississippi, which for some reason, these people in Illinois and uh, Missouri like to say it's the upper Mississippi. Sorry, it's not. We're, we're the upper Mississippi. Um, so when the French were here, they um, had a variety of trading sites, trading posts, those posts were called forts, but as Ryan said, there were nothing but some wood buildings and pickets. And um, none of them were permanent. So after the French uh, government left this area, you had no permanent positions like at Michelin-Mackinac. And the British then gained New France. And the British wanted New France because of the fur trade. Uh, they made a, a proclamation that no French people were to engage in the fur trade and uh, Pontiac quickly uh, changed their mind. And the British did realize that the people who knew the fur trade of this area were the French speaking people. And so the British fur trade continued under the same model that had been set up by the, uh, the French. And some of these trading sites then became permanent sites permanent residences. Um, the first one, I'm just sort of going in a circle, not chronological, uh, La Pointe up on Madeline Island, which is part of the Apostle Islands in um, Lake Superior. And again, the, the main fur trading uh, families in each of these areas were Frenchmen. So at La Pointe, you have the Cadat family, Jean-Baptiste, Jean-Baptiste Jr., uh, Michel, and their families were not pure French, but French Ashinabe. Um, and so there are these marital relationships that begin because if you're going to trade, you want to trade with family. And um, so you'll find that so many of these French names, as Albert uh, mentioned, have the, the Native American uh, culture within them. 
The, the next community is La Bay, if you're French, La Bay, if you're British, Green Bay, if you're American. And um, you have permanent settlement um, starting here right after the, the end of the, uh, the French and Indian War. Uh, the Langlaid family, who was, uh, uh, Charles was part of the French uh, army during the French and Indian War. He was left to take care of uh, Fort Michelin-Mackinac. And uh, when the British came, yeah, oh, you know, okay. I'll be, you know, a part of the British military. No problem. Can I continue the fur trade? Yes, you may. All right. That was the importance to maintain their, their uh, daily life and their culture. And so the Langlade family um, begins the settlement of uh, Green Bay at the mouth of the Fox River um, and other families, Corlier, Grignon. And at the same time, you have Jewish Canadians that are settling at La Bay with uh, Jacob Franks and John Law. So you're getting a, a mixed culture already. Down or up the Fox River, I should say, is uh, Kakana. Um, and this was a really great place to have a uh, fur trade post, it becomes a community. It started out with the Ducharme family and then the Grignon family. And again, there's the connections with the uh, Menominee at uh, Kakana and also at Green Bay. What is uh, now Milwaukee started out as a, uh, a trading post for Jacques Beau. He worked for the Northwest Company, which was a British fur trade company in competition with Hudson's Bay. And then Solomon Juno came to uh, join him, ends up marrying uh, Jacques' daughter. And um, the fur trade continues with him now under the American Fur Company. Where the Fox River curved north and the Wisconsin River came in and curved southwest was a uh, one and one fourth mile portage and a great place for a trading site. Uh, Pierre Paquette establishes his trading site there and uh, Portage becomes another important community. And then finally, we end up at La Prairie du Chien, um, or if you're local, it's Prairie du Chien. Um, and this community has the highest percentage of men engaged in the fur trade who reside there. Some of them come from the Illinois country. Some of them come from Mishlamackinac. Some come directly from Canada. Um, and you have a French speaking traders. You also have Scotsmen who are traders. And um, all of them in all of these settlements retain part of the culture that they brought with them. So. What can you see today? Green Bay and Prairie du Chien were uh, surveyed by an American uh, surveyor, but he went along with the settlements of the way they'd been laid out by the French speaking people. And so at Green Bay, which is on your left, right? Um, you have long lots that were placed on both sides of the Fox River. And the houses were built facing the river and then the land behind was agricultural. Although um, Green Bay residents were not very good farmers, um, unlike at Prairie du Chien. So again, the prairie is nine miles long from the Wisconsin River up to just about a mile north of where we are now. Um, that too was surveyed into long lots. But some of the first French speaking people to settle here on the prairie were from the Illinois country where you would have villages and farm lots. And so that's what you have at Prairie du Chien. You have three villages and farm lots. Um, and so again, you're, you're blending uh, the Illinois French with the uh, Canadian French. 
So if you go to visit these communities today, what can you see? Not much remains, I'll be honest. Um, the, the, the French speaking people were very retiring. They were very apolitical. Um, and so when the brash Americans come in, they really subsume and take over um, the communities and make them American. So at Green Bay, uh, where you will still find many French names, you're going to find only two structures that are left uh, from the time of the, the early French cultures. Both of these structures were built in the early 1800s. Uh, one is the, the long white one has a long name, uh, Roy, let me see, get this right, Roy Porlier Tank uh, Cottage. You'd never guess it was uh, French PS or PS, but it is. And uh, the other one, nobody knows. It was built with inside of a house and nobody's done any research for me to do next. Um, and, but both of these have been moved off of their original sites and they're at Heritage Hill State Park in Green Bay. But if you go to Green Bay, all the east-west roads follow the lot lines of those uh, long lots. Um, if you go to part, Portage, Portage, uh, these are the only structures uh, that are left and they call them the surgeon's quarters, but that's not the way they started. Uh, they were built by Francois Leroy and he was uh, again, a fur trader when the Americans build Fort Winnebago there, he becomes the sutler for the fort. And then in time he sells these uh, properties to the United States and they become the surgeon's quarters. And they are interpreted as surgeon's quarters and not um, the French culture, regrettably. And then at Prairie du Chien, here you have to this day, the greatest concentration of the French culture in Wisconsin. And I'm using the term French, but I really am not talking France French. It's a French culture that is a mixed culture. There's influence from French speaking Canada. There's influence from the Illinois country. There's influence from the native nations to which many of these men married into. And there's also Jewish culture, and there's also African American culture. So this term I use is French is really a very mixed culture, and there is a little bit of all of it still remaining. Uh, the Francois Vertifi house you will see uh, later on. Early 1800s, it started as one room, and then an addition put on. And built in the early 1800s by a woman. Um, and she had married a Pawnee, P A N I S, which is uh, a term for a slave. Um, and the, the French would take natives as slaves. And um, so her husband had been um, a slave. And she owned the property and then they were married and uh, lived here. And then it was purchased by Francois uh, Vertifi. Up to the private uh, the owner of the house right now, it has always been inhabited by people of French Canadian ancestry. The other house or one of the other houses you're going to see is the Strange Powers house. Uh, it doesn't look like a, a French house at all. That's because a lot of these houses were quite small. They may have been only one or two rooms. And as uh, people became more prosperous, they added on and built around the house. But Strange Powers was British Canadian, um, came here as a baker, married into the Antaya family, which the family originally came from the Illinois country. And uh, you'll see the inside of this house tomorrow with one of the earliest forms of uh, French log structures that you're going to find in the, what's now the state of Wisconsin. 
You are also going to go to the Ravu House. This name has just been attached. It really was built as the first place to have the mass celebrated in Prairie du Chien. It became uh, the residence for the priests that were assigned to St. Gabriel's. And then it was moved to its present location. Uh, but again, it's all hewn wood, brick infill, and it still has on the second floor the original French windows, not double hung sash, but uh, side hinge like you'll find in uh, the uh, Canada's and also in the lower Mississippi. Next house. This was uh, built by someone from the Illinois country. Again, it's been covered with uh, fake stone. You would never know. But um, one of the interior walls was exposed. And so this is just down the road from the uh, Powers House. These houses are located within one of the three villages that were here at the prairie. The next house is brick, not frame, not log, but it has all the characteristics of a French log house from Wisconsin. The rooms placement and the fact that you have a veranda in both the front and the back. Uh, this is Louis Robert's house, uh, the people from Minnesota. Louis Robert was in St. Louis, Prairie du Chien, and then went up to St. Paul. And this is a very unique form of French log structure to where your corner posts are inside uh, the house. And there used to be about four or five of these homes uh, up in Prairie du Chien. Next one, you'll never know, looks like a little Greek revival house. Uh, this is from the Galerno family. And this is one of the families that's of uh, mixed French, Canadian and African American culture. And then um, the structure that the Prairie du Chien Historical Society acquired and we will not be able to go into it because it was damaged um, during the flood. Um, uh, and this is the only house that remains from the main village of Prairie du Chien, which is the island uh, on which the Villa Louis uh, stands. And then uh, Joseph Rolet, who was the main uh, fur trader here, born in Quebec, and had an early house, but when his wife, ex-wife, got a better house, he decided he wanted a better house. Again, it looks Greek revival, but the inside is French Canadian. So you, you've got a blend of two cultures there. So what's gonna happen with all of these structures? Next one. Well, we had a flood. So there's the uh, Rolette house, which has been damaged in a successive amount of floods. And then you also have the uh, Saint Germain house. You can see we had water up to the windowsills. That's why we're not going there. Um, next one. This is uh, the two houses that you will be going to. The, the brown one is the uh, Strange Powers house. And they had to sandbag uh, because the water was right in the street up to the gutters in front of it. And the other one is the uh, Vertifi house and the water was 10 feet from the back door. In 1965, this had uh, water in it and the family abandoned the house in 1965 and sat abandoned for 20 years. Next one. Um, the Garlano house, sandbagging didn't work. And the little house next to it, you can see sandbagging didn't work. And that was the blacksmith shop of uh, Oliver Cherrier, the only blacksmith shop that uh, still exists. And there used to be quite a few blacksmiths uh, at Prairie du Chien because of the fur trade. 
Next one. Within these structures are pieces of furniture that have descended in the French Canadian families. Each one has a history. These were in the Saint Germain, which we moved up to the second floor. Next. These two pieces come from Prairie du Chien. Uh, the, the table has the family of descending in the uh, Gagné uh, Ducharme family, of which we have a descendant in the audience. And uh, the great chair also comes from Prairie du Chien. Next one. The armoire is signed, uh, Jean-Marie Coyer, and he was one of the early uh, French Canadians. And then you have a trunk from uh, Reuben Valley, who came here in the 1850s from French-speaking Canada. And let's go fast. Some chairs, which you'll see in my house, get the history there, next one. Um, the uh, candlestick is a wonderful story. That was found in the dump of Prairie du Chien. Uh, 18th century French. Next. And uh, we have things from uh, Vincennes here. Those two pieces come out of Vincennes. Next. So what's the future? The three houses that you're going to see are all privately owned. Um, the next generation of all of them have no interest in the homes. What's their future going to be? There are developers that would just love to buy these houses uh, and make them into Airbnbs, you know? That's, that's the thing. I live in the north end of Prairie du Chien. More and more of the houses are being turned into Airbnbs. Um, so no heirs, you've got flooding, you have developers wanting them. Are they gonna go up for auction? What about the furnishings? Again, the heirs don't want them. It's a future that we uh, have to decide in this community. What happens to the French Canadian culture of which is the greatest concentration in Wisconsin if this generation doesn't do something about it? Thank you. So the three of us have all talked about uh, history, cultural history, material culture. And some of this has become part of our public. Visitors can come. And um, there a new field developed not many years ago after I graduated from uh, school called public history. Public history is dealing with everything that you've heard this morning so that the public can learn about it. But the public wants it a bit simpler than academics. So um, our next speaker is uh, John W. Mann. He's a professor at the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire, uh, which is north of us. And he is the director of the public history program um, at the university. He specializes in history, Native uh, American studies, and um, has written a book called Sacagawea's People. And so we'll turn it over and to Professor Mann. Good morning. Um, I have uh, sort of uh, two things that I would encourage um, stakeholders of the French Heritage Corridor uh, to do. Um, the first would be to collaborate with the public history program uh, nearest you. Uh, and the second would be to be mindful of the, uh, the, the balance you strike in terms of uh, the values uh, of cultural resources that you emphasize. And so I'll, I'll elaborate on uh, both of those things uh, while being mindful of the time. It's a challenge for me to 
um, not go beyond 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so first, I think it, it makes sense to back up a little bit and talk about what is uh, public history. Uh, and uh, as noted, it was a field that has emerged relatively uh, recently in the early 1970s. It became a thing in academic circles, uh, really for two reasons. Uh, one, practical, uh, the other, uh, more historiographical. So uh, in the practical sense, public history emerged in part uh, because of a job crisis of the 1970s. Uh, actually, my father was a casualty uh, of that. He was um, in the PhD program at UW-Madison uh, in the early 1970s. He had two kids. He was uh, what we call ABD. Uh, so he was finished jumping through all the hoops, but the dissertation, he was all the dissertation, uh, had two children. Uh, and looked around and saw that uh, in his field, there was exactly one opening, uh, one job opening uh, in the United States. Uh, and so uh, he took a job outside of history, told himself that he would finish the dissertation at nights, so you know where this story ends, he ended up in a totally different field. Uh, a lot of people, however, uh, did uh, finish their PhDs and found work as historians uh, outside of the academic setting. Uh, so fortunately for uh, historians in the early 1970s, you had um, uh, the National Historic Preservation Act that had recently been passed, which created a lot of work uh, for historians doing Section 106 review and other things. Um, you also had the anticipation of the bicentennial, which caused uh, the infusion of dollars into uh, museums, whether at the local, state, uh, or national level. And so uh, history departments looked around and said, hey, uh, all of our newly minted PhDs are going off and working uh, at jobs outside of the academy. Maybe we ought to train them for do, to do that. Uh, and voila, uh, you had public history programs uh, emerge. Um, second, and I think more important reason that public history uh, as a field uh, emerged was that there was a, a growing recognition that uh, while there was uh, a huge appetite uh, for history uh, in the general public, uh, the general public was not very interested in what academic historians had to say uh, in the early 1970s. And there was good reason for that. Uh, with the, the emergence of the new social history, an effort to give voice to those who had been uh, previously excluded uh, from narratives, uh, historians, because of a lack of sources for a lot of these people, uh, had to turn to uh, theory. Uh, and so you had increasingly uh, narrow studies that were theory-driven, uh, jargon-filled, and consequently not very interesting uh, to the general public. And so a, a growing number of academics said, hey, we need to, to rebuild bridges uh, with uh, public audiences. Uh, so uh, for these two reasons, you get public history emerging uh, as a field. And um, I, I think that it's important that uh, people like me who teach uh, public history to students, um, do not become isolated in the ivory tower, right? Uh, because otherwise <laughs> you've got the threat of public history becoming the thing that was born in opposition uh, to, right? Um, becoming theory-driven, jargon-filled, uh, and uh, not interesting <laughs> uh, to uh, regular people. So for that reason, uh, our public history program at UW-Eau Claire uh, strives uh, whenever possible uh, to have um, even our uh, regular public history coursework uh, involve partnerships uh, with local communities. Um, so we do that in a whole variety of ways. Uh, to give you one example, right, when students learn about historic preservation, uh, they don't just read about it in books, uh, but they make determinations of eligibility for the National Register on uh, houses in Eau Claire, and we do this in partnership uh, with the city. Uh, to help it comply uh, with federal preservation law, right? So that this is not uh, an isolated uh, academic uh, exercise. Likewise, uh, our public history uh, seminar uh, always involves a community partner. Uh, we have various partners that will come up with discrete chunks of work that can be done uh, by a small group of students over the course of uh, a semester. Um, and uh, we've worked with um, the city, we've worked with museums, we've worked with uh, 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 private companies uh, to help them complete projects that, that they would like to see done. Uh, and then finally, our, our students are all required to um, complete internships. Uh, so 
Uh, in these various ways, right, we work with community partners frequently and uh, would encourage all the stakeholders uh, to look to uh, the history department nearest you uh, in the event that it has a public history program and recognize that there are ways that you can move your ball uh, forward uh, and at the same time uh, give students real world uh, valuable uh, experiences. So that was uh, the first thing I said I was going to cover. The second thing are uh, the values of cultural resources. And I think that it's important uh, that we keep these in mind. I actually had a sneak peek of the online modules that you'll be seeing uh, later on this afternoon and uh, was struck in looking through them and actually uh, in looking over uh, the program for this conference at what a good uh, balance has been struck uh, in terms of the emphasis of the various values uh, of cultural resources. So. Uh, academics who study uh, cultural resource management uh, have identified sort of four, uh, not entirely distinct, that is to say, uh, sometimes uh, overlapping uh, values of uh, cultural resources. And I think we would all do well to sort of uh, keep these at uh, the front of uh, mind. Uh, so uh, one of the values, and I, I should be careful to say that I'm not proposing a, a sort of hierarchy <laughs> of uh, cultural resource values. Um, but um, instead, I'm suggesting that uh, if we're not mindful of the way that we emphasize the different values that we associate with cultural resources, there can be, uh, there can be dangers there, right? Uh, so uh, what are the four values uh, of cultural uh, resources? Uh, one, uh, I think most important to me, although again, uh, no hierarchies, uh, is informational values, right? So uh, whatever cultural, whatever type of cultural resource we're talking about, say uh, Villa Louis, right, a historic structure, um, they can uh, provide us with information about the past, right? They're literally primary uh, sources. Uh, likewise, uh, an archaeological site holds uh, that promise. Um, and um, so this is one of the values that, that we ought uh, to bear in mind as we manage uh, cultural resources. Uh, they also have uh, associative or uh, symbolic value, right? Uh, they give us a sense of the shared past. They foster uh, a sense of community. This is one that gets highlighted a lot in the United States, right? A country where uh, we don't necessarily share the same uh, uh, language, culture, history, ethnicity, uh, religion. Uh, but what we do have in common, right, is a sense of the shared uh, past. Uh, George Washington slept here. Uh, this sort of thing. Um, in the case of the French Heritage Corridor, right, uh, there could be a tendency um, to highlight the contributions of those with uh, French heritage. But uh, again, in looking at the, the conference program, uh, as well as the module that you'll be seeing later on today, um, a really responsible job, I think, of not uh, overlooking uh, the importance of American Indian contributions to the French presence uh, on this continent. Um, so you can see there where uh, maybe there's a pitfall. Um, additionally, uh, cultural resources have, here I'm on to the, the third value, uh, aesthetic value, uh, right? Uh, and in some cases that might uh, mean fancy places uh, to look at, but uh, aesthetic value can also refer to um, types of um, uh, workmanship, right? Uh, or materials included that become uh, rare. And um, so this is another reason that we uh, don't knock down Villa Louis, right? That we want to preserve uh, cultural resources. Um, and then the final value, um, and this is one that some of my uh, academic colleagues maybe look down their nose at uh, when I do not, actually, I, uh, I'm a big advocate for uh, recognizing the fact that cultural resources have uh, economic value, right? Um, and that this can be a, a, a powerful argument in favor of preserving old buildings uh, or cultural resources uh, more broadly, although it doesn't take much imagination to recognize that uh, economic value can sometimes uh, work in ways uh, that disadvantage uh, other values of uh, cultural uh, resources, uh, notably uh, the informational. So. Um, those are, are my two recommendations uh, that I uh, uh, would make to uh, stakeholders of the French uh, Heritage Corridor. 
Um, and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you might have about these um, later on. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Mann. And having that kind of an endorsement uh, means a lot because uh, just as some of our other speakers, you know, it, it's clear that we all kind of straddle different uh, areas of uh, discipline, of thought, of, of vocation, um, different backgrounds culturally. There's all kinds of overlap. And that's, that's I think, hopefully something that's abundantly clear to all of us that there is no like one single pure route. The whole thing is uh, a real tapestry. And to start to think about these things as multi-layered, uh, multi, so many opportunities that avail are availed to us is really, I think, a much more enlightened and dynamic way of, of, of caring for all of these wonderful uh, historic treasures and the communities and the people who are the stewards of these treasures and seeing how it's all interrelated and that there's nothing shameful of understanding the economic drivers that are part of what keeps us all afloat. And the French going all the way back in their first interactions with the native peoples of the Americas, that was the, the connection. There was a recognition that there was an economic driver, but from that blossomed all kinds of fabulous things. So we come back to that and I invite everybody at this point to unmute yourselves virtually, uh, liven up uh, and we've got uh, about 20 minutes now before we uh, enter into our next phase of uh, tabling and breakout rooms to start a, a conversation and what comes to mind, what's come to mind while we've had these uh, presenters. And um, let's see, there's some comments in the uh, chat and uh, I, I'm not seeing people on mute. So I don't know if you want to just raise your hand or write something in chat, but uh, in any case, it's uh, something I'd love to hear some of people's uh, impressions at this point. Oh, there they are. Um, hi, Connie. Good to see you. And uh, excellent. Oh, there's Seal. And Marisol is on. Thrilled about that. Okay, so we're being shy, which I'm very surprised by. I'm shy that, uh, surprised that we have uh, everyone here that that's just like, hmm, I'm not sure what to say. We are among friends. There's no right or wrong comments or, aunt, or questions, that sort of thing. Um, but if no one is uh, wanting, okay, fine. Oh, 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 now all of a sudden I see hands are going up. So uh, I saw Charles's hand first. So, you know, he was, he was the quickest. So. It may be that whether you would like to come up here because our uh, sound isn't great or I can always repeat what you say or ask, but here comes Charles. So come on, my my partner in crime. Thank you, Lisa. Thank here you very he much. Is. Okay, I'll, I'll talk loud. <clears throat> I'm an academia and I'm accustomed to that. I find that um, intervention was excellent. Um, you know, there is a very, very simple and um, connection between yesterday and today, uh, specifically about uh, the Native American question. And uh, at the beginning, when we were planning this meeting today, my suggestion was to really use the Native American today and yesterday as a theme, because there's a continuity. Now, I forgot the name, but uh, the people of Wisconsin will remember there is a tribe in the northern part of Wisconsin which is actually fighting now a road which, right, <clears throat> and that's today, okay? Today again, the right of Native American people is ignored, pushed around, etc. So it's a reality. Now to come back to the past, the question is 
why the French were different. Well, the French who came here, and I study this because there is a paper trail, okay? They did not look down on it. They found it very nice, this um, culture, uh, Native American culture. They, they fit right in. They lack the freedom of it. And it's um, perhaps because majority of them were Celt and the Celt uh, civilization in France always was this freedom of attitude, but it was essential. Now there's a lot of people discuss the word sauvage that you find in this French description. The word sauvage in French doesn't mean savage. There's a, you know, again, translation over this in Italian, traduttore, traditore. The translation sometimes is wrong. You know, they even find this in the Bible, by the way, many times. The word sauvage in French meant free <clears throat> from the constraint of civilization. It was actually a compliment. So they, they naturally combined with the Native American from the economy and also, you know, let's be uh, the French being the French, you know, after a pipe, they like a good conversation with maybe a, a lady, you know. So, <laughs> This is a natural way. All right, that, my friends. Okay. All the friends were not men. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> but the, the men without the people who came to North America, you know, this wasn't. So it creates a situation. So I think we have to develop in the French Heritage Society and the French Heritage Corridor Initiative the fact we have to bring back that history and bring it up because it's linked to today. So this is unique thing uh, and it has to be uh, kept on. And as far as the public history is concerned, this is a great, great, great initiative. That's a phenomenal thing. And finally, the question that Marie Antoine had, what is going to be the future of these buildings? If we want to save history, we have to make it economically interesting and advantageous. If the, the town or the city or the village, what you want to call a prairie du chien, can understand that people come here, would look at those houses, perhaps they can put together the initiative and make sure they are protected because that will be an advantage. That's, mm -hmm. that's the answer. You have to make it interesting, okay? It shall be. Oh. Not at all. No, I, I think that you've just posed the perfect question for our group, because my feeling is that if this is an issue here in Prairie du Chien, there's a grand, a great likelihood that it's also an issue in other parts of the French Heritage Corridor. And there's a good chance that others have been grappling with this conundrum. And maybe some people have come up with some solutions, some ideas how we might work together. Who knows? So, Jim. I promise I'll fill you in. Just to kind of try to summarize for our virtual uh, participants, uh, 
Jim Paul, who is not just the Illinois ambassador for FHC, but also the president of the Bourbonnais Grove Historical uh, Society in Illinois, uh, kind of gave the, the uh, account that he's found it to be quite helpful to team up with civic leaders and doesn't have to be, you know, a huge urban pop, uh, you know, metropolis. It could be any size community, could be large, could be small, somewhere in between, but that engaging all kinds of uh, entities in this common purpose oftentimes results in some very helpful other perspectives that perhaps you haven't thought of. And that, again, is sort of the beauty of this initiative is that in many ways we're very like-minded, but in others we have unique experiences and challenges depending on where it is that we reside and what it is that we're, we're interested in caring for. And by coming together and having that you know, nice discussion and exchange, oftentimes we find that uh, there's an answer out there that we just haven't thought of. And so uh, giving the example uh, in his community this has been uh, quite helpful. And even engaging not just local government, but kind of then trickling out and, and going beyond that. I know for a fact that um, I'm looking at Carol Kuntz from Prairie de Rocher, who is uh, the guru of not just uh, Les Potagers uh, and uh, uh, the greenest thumb that I know, but also an excellent advocate for her entire community, uh, which oftentimes does uh, broaden out to the Randolph County uh, commissioners and to local farmers who are also colleagues in Les Amis, uh, uh, des, uh, the Fort de Chartres, and all kinds of other opportunities to, to kind of outreach and partner. And so that might be something where Perhaps you've heard Mary Lee's, you know, kind of call for some ideas, for some help. And I hope as a community, even if we don't come up with that recommendation on the spot, it gets us thinking and it, it greases the, you know, we, we know now what is a challenge that perhaps we can help with. Um, I don't know if that, you know, spark something among our uh, people virtually or some other comments. I'd seen Greg, uh, you had raised your hand in, in our audience and you're welcome to come up here if you'd like. Uh, in fact, it probably would be best because that way our, our people attending virtually will get an opportunity to hear you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I mean, this just builds on the discussion we've been having. You know, what is the role of the French Heritage Corridor in trying to foster uh, issues like this to help um, create public-private partnerships. You know, what's the role of state historical societies? Uh, what's the role of local governments? What's the, the role of the legislature uh, in helping to preserve these historic uh, places? And so I just want to use this as a way to stimulate discussion more than make any grand statements. Thank you for that. Yes, would you like to come up and ask your question? You don't have to, but you're welcome to. Okay, great. Thank you, you bet. So my name is Susan Farber, and this is my first time uh, attending your conference. And I'm honored uh, just to share a few words with you about Dubuque, which is where I'm from. And for those of you uh, that don't know, it was founded by a Meskwaki Indian out of Canada whose name was Julian Dubuque. Um, and we are not too far from here. Uh, but in talking about historic preservation and the economic driver and the economic values, um, as we are the oldest city in Iowa, we have um, probably over 2,000 historic uh, buildings within our footprint. And um, as a member of our city council, one of our priorities is historic preservation. So we are with the public private partnerships as you had just said, uh, moving forward um, for uh, the past as well as the future in restoring a lot of our areas, a lot of our districts and a lot of our brownstones, if you will, 
Um, and we do have public funds, private funds, and other philanthropic funds. And it just takes a little bit of enthusiasm and energy um, and dedication to the founding fathers uh, and to the preservation of these beautiful buildings. And so um, just want to thank you for that. And I'm learning a lot just by being here today. So, and I lived in France for many years. So merci beaucoup. <laughs> and merci à vous. And thank you so much for sharing that. And it also kind of reminds me that we don't just have to think within our own uh, United States. Remember, we have these ties both to Quebec, to Canada, and to France, and that we have partnerships there. In fact, one of um, a, a possible kind of next steps might be to explore the possibility of sister cities. Uh, for example, in Chicago, our sister city is pa Paris. Um, but why not, whether we have it in Canada as well as in France, why not explore that possibility where we can find um, something in common that we can reach out to our friends in these other communities in these other countries. And again, that can only help uh, not just with tourism, but certainly with something like that and uh, promote enthusiasm, partnership sharing. I've also heard stories of uh, people I've met along the way where, um, in fact, I think it was uh, Charlotte, you might have shared that with me uh, in Cape Girardeau, uh, Missouri, doing some research. Uh, Charlotte, I remember you telling me that you ended up having a lot of luck, even though your French skills are not as fantastic as maybe you would hope. I could say the same for myself, uh, but they were good enough that you connected with someone in France who was able to provide all kinds of extremely helpful information in your research and making enriching the museum that you uh, direct. And so I do believe that that should not stop us to think, you know, we need to think large as well as, you know, um, very localized, I think at times. And I think, yes, Charlotte. Thank you for sharing. That is. Ooh, I hope to come and eat that. So what Charlotte was sharing is that, uh, you know, Cape Girardeau, uh, the namesake Girardeau is actually, uh, again, through her research, she's helped uh, clear this up. It's really the son uh, who's uh, the signif significant one. And uh, he'll be celebrating a, a 300th birthday uh, later this year in December. And uh, this research that was that was done uh, was very useful in, in getting a lot of information about the Girardeau. Carol, I see a hand. Come on up. All right. So my my virtual people are very shy. And Connie, I do see, oh, and I see Steele too. After uh, Carol makes her uh, comments, we'll, we'll call on a few people. I just wanna make a, a point of a connection w from the area of Fort de Chartres and Prairie de Rocher uh, is a necessity to reach out into all aspects of that community and across the river. We all deal, and really all up and down the Mississippi River, we are all threatened. Um, with flooding. These are all political issues that communities that get saved, those that don't. And by reaching out and making your history present and viable in communities, you also give value. So when, when decisions are made about funding and levy protection, those are all really real effects that can be made by us joining together as a force. So I just want to think, you know, even broader, you know, there is a political view and we make sure we're constantly reaching out to our um, 
with the local politicians, regional, state, and sometimes national. And that will also help safeguard, hopefully, our communities. Mm -hmm. Well said. Absolutely. Hey, Lisa. If you don't mind, you're, you're uh, in, uh, in the batting box or whatever the... Yeah, let a couple people um, virtually, and then I will absolutely have you join uh, in the conversation. Um, let's see. Hey, Lisa? Yes. Yeah, it's Colby. Colby, yeah. I know Just, that um, <laughs> well, uh, On the heels of, of those comments and, and on some of the earlier comments regarding questions of, you know, what will happen to some of these historic homes and, and resources, Mm -hmm. um, one of the interesting things that we might want to discuss is, is not just how we build uh, geographic bridges, but how do we build generational bridges? How, how do we develop the next generation or the next couple of generations that will become the stewards of this heritage and, these, and this history? Ooh, I love how you primed us. I feel like in our afternoon discussion, we are going to answer some of those questions. I like that, Colby. And I'm hoping when you host one of these breakout rooms in a few minutes that you're going to turn your camera on. We need to see you. Um, I, I, I will do that. Okay. And Connie, I know you had uh, something you'd like to share. Go right ahead. Great to see you. And and go go visit Connie uh, at, at her wonderful... Um, bed and breakfast, the Connor house. Go ahead, take it away. <laughs> it's nice to see you too, Lisa. Um, to piggyback on what Carol was saying, the reason I, I raised my hand was, my thought was, we already have, and so we have this to, to explore and, and enrich the historic, you know, and we also have the economic, but we already have St. Jen that, that is a national park. Is there any other movement? I know Prairie Rocher is working on that. Is there any other movement with anyone else in this initiative that is working on that? Um, I think that you know to get momentum, you know, to get things, and you you always start with what's already working and and what already has energy. And if we can take that, and yes, the the bottom line is, is we want to save it. I, I think and we want to save the buildings, we want to save the history. And um, and to do that, if we have enough clanging bells, as I should say, in enough different areas that has that that tie, oh, yeah. um, we're going to be able to 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 then fight for the properties yes. that are going to be flooded and fight so for funny. everything. You so. have absolutely hit on something. I think, again, what we have to uh, start really doing is realize we, as a, uh, the FHC, we are a collective. Mm -hmm. What's good for uh, Wisconsin is good for Missouri. What's good for Minnesota is good for Iowa, et cetera, et cetera. That we are stronger as we are a whole. And that, um, for example, like what you're saying, uh, yeah, let's say we've got flooding issues one place or we're trying to have national park status in one place. Let's get our lawmakers from, from other French heritage corridor states and maybe beyond to advocate for that. They have to see the value. And if we are joined together, like what Carol is suggesting, accessing, you know, this is not just uh, there's nothing shameful in admitting that it's an economic thing, nothing shameful to admit that there's politics involved too, and that we can cross the barrier. I know in your community, I've seen Democrats and Republicans getting on board with one another and saying, yeah, we believe in this. We are not divided politically. We are united. I believe that the French Heritage Corridor can actually be a uniter. There's, there's some good, you know, really positive stuff that we as a collective can help. And I'm really, you know, uh, optimistic in, uh, in that fact. So I'd like to now invite uh, another uh, person who'd like to make a comment. Come on down. Um, 
Yeah, hi everybody, um, or bonjour. Uh, my name is Michael Poma, and I'm here representing the DuSab Heritage Association in, in Chicago. Um, I'm, I live in Milwaukee, drove here. The, the internet said three hours, it took me four to get here this morning. A lot of the roads were out because of the flooding. <laughs> but um, yeah, this is really exciting for us. I mean, um, just like what Lisa was saying about um, opportunities and um, the future of French culture in America. Um, I don't know if you know about Jean-Baptiste um, Poindusab, who was the founder of Chicago. His father was a Frenchman. His mother was, um, was from Saint-Domingue of, of um, black origin. And um, he came to this country in the latter part of the 18th century, um, did fur trading, um, was uh, captured and in, not enslaved, but he was um, imprisoned at Fort Michimil in Mackinac um, because they said he was a sympathizer to the Americans. Um, they saw his social um, intellectual intelligence and the commandant there sent him to St. Clair, which is, I don't know if you know Michigan, but um, with the hand, St. Clair is just, up, just above the, um, the thumb on, the, on Lake Huron to manage his properties. And from there, he went down um, into Indiana and founded um, and married Kitty Hawa, a Potawatomi um, um, Indian, and um, established um, fur trading post, which became the city of Chicago. Um, and in, in Creole, um, their, their, their motto for the country is l'union fait la force, um, 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 unity makes strength. And what we want to do is like partner with organizations like the um, French um, Heritage Society, because together with that, with that um, combined um, commonality of history, we can make a difference. In Chicago, um, the um, Dusab Heritage Association has made very big strides. Um, it was founded, the association was, was founded by Haitians probably about 20, 24, 25 years ago. Um, Mayor Washington, which was about 20 years ago, um, um, declared Dusab as um, the founder of the city. Up, up until that point, it was, they had said it was, Kin, um, Kinsey was the founder, but in reality, it was Dusab. And um, he dedicated an area where the Chicago River meets Lake Michigan for the Dusab Park. So we've been working on that for 20 years, um, doing cultural, educational um, events to try to raise money to, um, to work this, um, make this park um, a destination area in Chicago, just like the great architecture, the sculptures and everything that are in Chicago. Um, last year, um, the Friends of the Park um, got a, a grant and we're at the point now where we need interaction with different communities. This might be a very good um, group to, um, to work with. And we're working on the establishment of the, um, the architecture of the structure of the park, as well as um, um, trying to come up with an idea for a sculpture. And if you've been to Chicago, you know that architecture and sculpture are like the, um, the souls of the city. So we want to make an impact because the French did have an impact on Chicago. Um, so with that, um, I'll give it back to Lisa. One of my charges was to meet Lisa, and so oh, she was here. Yes, yeah. And then a little bit about myself. Just like I'm, I really was excited by some of the um, the discussions this morning, the presentations. Um, I'm Sicilian from my father. Um, his my father's um, family immigrated from Sicily. Uh, my father's uh, met my mother in Detroit, was where I was born, but I am. The person that you're talking about. My mother's family are from um, Quebec from the 17th century. They've been, they were in K Quebec until the um, middle part of the 18th century, um, came here, started a logging camp in Upper Michigan, and um, it was really an interesting story from my perspective. But um, our fam family names from the um, French side are Gagnon, which is very common in Canada, um, La Liberté, and, and De Lime. So um, as I was doing genealogical research, and we were, we were one of the lucky um, people in doing for a family because our family kept pictures. So we have tintype pictures from the um, mid 19th century 
and my family were storytellers, so we know a lot about our heritage, and we still do a lot of things that are very Quebecois in um, in the family. I mean, like we have fromage de tête. I don't know if anybody is from Quebec, but that's something that you have at Christmas time, tourtière, um, oh, yeah. all those all those things that um, that make that make us French. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that'd be great. Um, but um, also, um, I'm Haitian. You wouldn't you wouldn't think that in, in Haiti I'd be, I'd be considered what they call um, uh, um blanc noir, which means a, um, a white black person. So um, in Haiti there are people. There's perception that all Haitians are black. Not all Haitians are black. There, Haiti has every gradation of color and mixture that you can imagine, just like the Quebecois. And then uh, the guy you said in my family were um, intermarried with um, the indigenous family. Our Haitian family came to Quebec or Quebec at the time of the Haitian Revolution, which is between 1796 and 1804, as well as many um, persons from Haiti made their um, their way that way. Many went to New Orleans in the eastern part of the, part of the United States. Um, our family were what they called in Haiti the Jean de Couleur. They were mixed French and um, and African um, um, background. And so it's, you know, it's interesting that we're talking about because French culture isn't like what you have in your mind as a person from um, Paris that's been pretty much from one original um, group, but our, our French heritage in this country is a heritage that's very um, intermixed, very rich, and, um, and very um, interesting. So. Um, I'm happy to be part of the um, Dusab Heritage Association. My wife, I met in Haiti after university. I went to Haiti to teach. Um, that was my first job before going to, coming back to the States and going to graduate school. We've been married for 45 years. She just recently retired from the Ecole Francaise um, d'Immersion de Milwaukee. It's one of the, one of the few um, public immersion schools in the country. It's it just celebrated its 45th anniversary. And... Um, the previous principal even um, received um, an award for Macron and his wife came to visit the school because it's so successful. And it's a public school, an inner city school, and um, the successes of that school are insurmountable. Um, and so anyway, I've got lots of ties to this yeah. group. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for taking up so much no, time, but, no. but we want we want to work together. Absolutely. And Michael, thank you for sharing sure. so many really fascinating things and important things. Um, we're going to uh, transition to our next uh, little thing here uh, to allow our virtual participants to meet with Seal Miller Boucher, our Iowa ambassador, and Colby Bartlett, our ambassador from Indiana. But keep all of these wonderful comments and, and things that have been shared today um, for the afternoon. Remember, we're taking a lunch break at 1230, but we're coming back at two Central Standard Time. There's a lot of really exciting things that are happening. And I think that uh, our discussions uh, to follow will be uh, even richer. So um, it's been a wonderful morning. Uh, have a good discussion with Seal and Colby, and we will check back with you in uh, a little less than two hours. Um, bon appétit and uh, enjoy. And we are back. Welcome back, everybody. I hope uh, our virtual attendees had a, a lovely break, uh, breakout room, and then a nice break. I know we did here uh, in Prairie du Chien. And uh, we are now ready for our afternoon session. We've had all kinds of, of great ideas and uh, uh, input for the morning session that uh, has given me a lot of good food for thought. So uh, I certainly hope that after all of our presentations this afternoon that we'll have plenty of uh, time for um, resuming that great discussion. Uh, I had so many things I wanted to say, but you know, we gotta let everybody have their moment. So, uh, the good news is that even after today, this discussion doesn't end. This is just a moment in time, just like all of these dates that mark uh, specific moments in time. 
the real story is all the things that happen in between. So uh, with that said, let's, let's continue. And uh, I am absolutely delighted uh, to introduce our next speaker, uh, remarks from the Honorable uh, Consul General of France in the Midwest, Yannick Tagan, who has been um, such, such a friend to the French Heritage Corridor and to French Heritage Society, our Chicago Midwest chapter. Um, he and his team, his entire office, have always been uh, just so warm and embracing and um, we're learning together. And that to me is the name of the game. We help each other. And that spirit is so alive um, with under his leadership. And I am just eternally grateful and um, excited to hear what he has to say. So come on down. Thank you very much, Lisa, for this uh, very, very kind uh, introduction. Uh, and indeed, uh, dear friends, uh, I'm uh, very glad to be here with you uh, today. Uh, and I'm extremely thankful uh, for all of you to, to gather here uh, to celebrate and to help foster uh, the French Heritage Corridor, an important uh, initiative that we're happy and proud to steadily and uh, as strongly as we can support uh, at the French uh, consulate. So I see today many familiar faces in, in the audience, so I think you know my personal attachment uh, to this initiative. Uh, this is my second uh, annual conference of the French Heritage Corridor that I'm attending. Uh, and I attended many other events organized under the auspices of this, uh, of this initiative, and I'm very excited to be part of uh, today's uh, discussion. Uh, this morning's presentations were uh, really, really fascinating for me. Uh, and this afternoon's program uh, seems uh, highly promising uh, as well. I'm also very enthusiastic to be here in Prairie du Chien uh, for the first time, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to visiting uh, all the sites described by uh, Mary uh, this morning, uh, all sites which are amazing signs of the commercial exchanges uh, between the Quebec, American, American Indian, uh, French groups uh, in the region. And here, I just want to, to, to stop for uh, one second to uh, say how much I'm uh, uh, grateful for the remarks which have been done about the meaning of French here in this initiative, uh, remarks that I share very much. Uh, and I will uh, use French in the same meaning in, in my remarks. It's uh, French as a, a blend of uh, French speaking culture. It's not French as a French French or France French. I don't know how it has been said, but uh, I very much agree which, uh, with what has been said this morning uh, in this regard. So besides tomorrow's uh, sightseeing, Prairie du Chien uh, seems to me a particularly interesting uh, choice to hold this year's annual conference uh, because of its relevance, uh, because it's very symbolic, I think, uh, for the Francophone culture here uh, in North uh, America. Why? Why? Because first of all, it has one of the most amazing French place names I've ever seen all across the Midwest. And that's important because French place names, I think, are a very good point of entry to discover all this uh, shared history, all, all this heritage. Uh, and uh, it's interesting to see how many uh, French place names you have all, all across the Midwest. Uh, it's always a, a good uh, way to uh, interest uh, people coming from France to the Midwest. But here with Prairie du Chien, uh, you're definitely the, the winner. Prairie du Chien, uh, as well, is very symbolic uh, of how it all started uh, on how uh, this French and Francophone culture spread out all across uh, the Midwest. Um, and I think none uh, of the stakeholders, none of the families uh, that were mentioned this morning could think that they prompted the start of a 350 year old uh, friendship. For France, these uh, individual stories uh, mark the opening of new horizon, full of possibilities, discovery, and new uh, adventures, which nurture for uh, a short period of time, at least, uh, the dream of the creation of a new France, a new France, uh, connecting uh, Quebec uh, and the Caribbean. For America, what happened here was no less than the beginning of uh, what you call the great melting pot, 
no less than uh, the rediscovery uh, of the soon to be Main Street uh, of America. And, and finally, no, no less than a genuine contribution to the formation of a new incredible uh, nation. So I doubt that Marquette and Joliet have imagined uh, to be paving the way uh, for a partnership that has fostered in a fruitful cultural, political, and economic collaboration which hasn't wavered since. I doubt as well that fur traders uh, would have imagined that forts, which were not forts, that's what I understood this morning, it was just small, small, uh, small places, but forts established to protect the trading post would open up the way to today's Franco-American flourishing partnership. I, do, I doubt that they would have imagined that this place, standing today, if I'm correct, as the smallest and second oldest town of this country, would become a place of discussion to promote the partnership between France and the United States of America. We could not have imagined, but we can. And we want and need people to get acquainted with the importance of this heritage for today's regional identity, for today's friendship between France and America, for today's relation and connections between Canada, France, Haiti, and the US. So this is why as a consulate, we work in close cooperation with the Chicago chapter of the French Heritage Society since the inception of the French Heritage Corridor Initiative. The work accomplished in three years is simply admirable. The network they have established, the discussions and the reflections they have nurtured, the grants they have provided to important historical sites, the website they have put online, and the events they have hosted uh, are all amazing opportunities for everyone to discover the shared path that both communities walk through hand in hand. Today, the possibilities to understand the history of what was once La Nouvelle France and its influence in today's town and cities are tenfold. From the Mississippi River to the Great Lakes, many associations, which are represented here, have already shed a lot of light on the French-American connections in areas ranging from architecture to history and language. So I cannot highlight enough the importance of the work which has been done by these local associations in safeguarding, promoting and expanding the memory of France, of French culture, of French speaking culture in the Midwest. And there are still today a limited amount of individuals who are aware of our historical links, uh, which is why initiatives such as the French Heritage Corridor are so vital to us and to the public. And so we're convinced that we can go further, we can do better, and we can nurture the friendship we have built since Market and Joliet landed here. And the French Heritage Corridor represents today for us a, ma a major vehicle in spreading the knowledge around the Francophone's culture, contribution to the American melting pot, and around the thriving connections between the Midwest and the Francophone world. This initiative today we see has many different dimensions still to be unfolded to continue celebrating this heritage. And I will be happy to work with each of you in as many relevant directions as possible to make it thrive. And I have to confess that this morning's discussion popped up new ideas and I started discussing with them with, with, with some of you and, and I will be happy to do so again today. But here, I would like to highlight maybe two main lines of action. First one is education, because it's very important for us. The French Heritage Corridor can definitely help increase the knowledge on the impact of the French and Francophone culture on this region through Midwestern, through Midwestern schools. And so in this respect, I would like to pay tribute to the work which, which has already been done uh, by Professor Juvik to provide teachers with adapted educational material. I guess we will uh, I'm not getting your sign. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think uh, there will be more details coming up uh, this afternoon, but I, I already want to highlight the importance of this endeavor because providing interested teachers with teaching materials about the beginning of French presence in the Midwest, as well as a relationship with other groups in the region is one of the most efficient way to make this history 
and this heritage accessible to the widest, widest audience possible. And that's what we strive towards here. And I was happy this morning to hear about an important immersion school in Milwaukee, because I think here what we can do is to help the French Heritage Corridor uh, to build more partnerships with schools which have active and strong French programs. There are many of them, but more specifically, I think these immersion schools, which are here in the Midwest, could be very important partners uh, in this endeavor. Here in Wisconsin, in Minnesota as well, there are a lot of French immersion uh, programs which are thriving and which could be interesting partners, I think, for the French Heritage Corridor, and maybe could help to address um, the uh, topic uh, touched upon by uh, Colby this uh, morning about this generational, generational gap uh, to, uh, to bridge uh, at some point. Another line of action is uh, about creating new destinations. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, this afternoon's discussion uh, with you, Andrew, uh, because it's another essential objective, I think, in celebrating French heritage. Uh, so we, we, will, we will hear from, from you and from the Wisconsin Department of, of Tourism. Uh, and I think it's important because you have a lot of uh, historical sites related to French presence here in Wisconsin. And I would be happy uh, to uh, collaborate with you to increase the interest of visitors uh, for this heritage here in Wisconsin. Uh, but I'd be happy to uh, engage uh, with uh, other colleagues from uh, agencies like Atou France, uh, who are just experts in uh, promoting new destination to see how we can work uh, together uh, in this, uh, in this uh, endeavor. Creating a backdrop against which learning French in the Midwest can become more popular and creating out of this heritage economic opportunities as you gathered our important line of action for us. So in this respect, uh, we aim in close cooperation with the French Heritage Corridor the Haitian Consulate, the delegation of Quebec uh, in, in Chicago, to organize uh, an event with relevant stakeholders in Chicago later uh, this year, with the goal of highlighting the French, Haitian, and Canadian influence in Chicago and Midwestern states to draw in tourism, investment, and promote French teaching and learning. So the objective will be to gather political and economic decision makers coming from as many different fields as possible, education, tourism, and other, to invite them to incorporate this heritage in their own respective strategies. So it will obviously be an Illinois-centered uh, event, and I'm sorry for uh, our friend from Wisconsin, but you, you will be all welcome, obviously, to, to attend. It's not that far away. It's only a, a four and a half uh, drive from, uh, from here. So we hope, to, we hope to see you there. What we want to do is to demonstrate that French heritage in the Midwest prompts high interest among the community and that all interested stakeholders are highly mobilized to make the best out of our common histories. I will close here because I think I get some signs. I, I've been too long. I just want to thank a couple of people. I want to thank all the stakeholders who have made this even a uh, highly successful venture filled with uh, bonne entente and camaraderie as were the previous events uh, I attended. I want to thank you, Lisa, uh, for your uh, dynamism, your enthusiasm, your enthusiasm. I will say it in French, um, because I think we we owe you uh, we owe you a lot. I want to thank our uh, Wisconsin ambassador for the French Heritage Corridor, Mary. I cannot see her right now. Uh, I would like to uh, thank the whole team of the Chicago chapter of the French Heritage Society, and uh, extend a special thanks to uh, to Jennifer from uh, New York. The, Executive Director of the French Heritage Society, uh, because your presence today here is very meaningful, uh, I think, to, uh, to, all, of, to all of us. Uh, and I do hope to see you again uh, during other events here uh, in the Midwest. So we all are very much looking forward as the French consulate working with all of you to promote this uh, wonderful initiative. Thank you very much for your attention. Merci, Yannick. Now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our next speaker uh, for other remarks. Uh, we have uh, Jean Nami Basile 
uh, who is the um, public and governmental affairs officer from the Delegation du Québec, the Quebec office in Chicago, but just as uh, the consul uh, general may be located in, in Chicago, in this office in Chicago, and French Heritage uh, Society's Chicago Midwest chapter may be in Chicago. That doesn't mean we only care about Chicago. We care about the whole Midwest. And I know that John and her, uh, her uh, predecessor, Martin Dion, and uh, the team there very much does make their um, themselves very uh, involved in all throughout the Midwest. And I'm very impressed how you hit the ground running and with your warmth and your, um, your willingness to help. Uh, there's been many times when I have, you know, just out of the air asked for, uh, you know, some assistance around the corridor or, you know, just some support. And uh, you've always been very, very quick to, to do that and um, to do it with, um, uh, in a in a way that that really makes me feel like you know what we really are partners and um, even though it's French Heritage Society and the French Heritage Corridor, uh, just as uh, it's been pointed out many times today, this alludes to something beyond the country of France. It's something that uh, has has really taken on a new dimension and that oftentimes our access to this uh, French culture, French language does come to us from Quebec. And so uh, it, is, it is really wonderful to have that, that good connection. And uh, I'll be happy to hear what you have to say now. So take the floor. <laughs> Quite all right. Mon cher Lisa, Monsieur le Consul Général de France à Chicago, chers invités, I'm Jeanne lamy belzil and I'm the Public and Governmental Affairs Advisor at the Quebec office in Chicago. I'm very pleased to be here with you today on behalf of the Quebec government. Our office is the official representative of the government of Quebec in Chicago and covers 12 states across the Midwest, including Wisconsin. Um, the office supports Quebec companies and promotes Quebec sector of excellence develops partnership with universities, with governments, promotes Quebec artists, cultural exchanges, and of course, promotes and highlights francophonie and French heritage in the US. As you may know, since 1974, French has been the only official language in the province and close to 95 of Quebecers, 95% of Quebecers know French and more than 83% speak French at home. As the official language in Quebec is French, Quebec is also a full member of the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie and is considered one of the most active members of the OIF. That being said, the government of Quebec is committed to promoting French and celebrating the Francophone cultures and the French heritage in the US. In order to do so, we are happy to count on several partners in the Midwest, such as the Alliance Française, the French Consulate, universities, and of course, the Chicago Midwest chapters of the French, chapter of the French Heritage Society. As we know, French is not, is not strictly a foreign language. It's also part of your and our history, and especially here in Wisconsin. In addition, I'd like to highlight the work of one of our Quebec partners, Le Centre de la Francophonie des Amériques. This Quebec-based organization was created by the government of Quebec in 2008 and aims to promote and enhance an exciting Francophonie across the Americas. In pursuit of that mission, the center focuses its initiatives on the social development of Francophone communities by strengthening and enriching among relation among them and by leveraging the contribution of the numerous francophiles. The center promotes creativity, new ideas, solidarity, and cooperation while discharging its duty to remember the past. As we know, this past and this shared history um, are not necessarily well known. So I'm glad that organization and initiative like the Centre de la Francophonie des Amériques and the Chicago, the French Heritage Corridor can raise this awareness here in the Midwest, but also in Quebec. 
The Market and Joliet 350th Expedition Anniversary also remind us of the importance of the St. Lawrence and the Great Lakes Seaway in our history and how it's still shaping our relationships. Thanks in large part to the Waterway, Quebec and the Midwest exchange for more than $20 billion per year. And this started in some way with several, several coureurs des bois, native people and a canoe. I'm also particularly pleased to be here with you today in Prairie du Chien since the province of Quebec and the state of Wisconsin signed the cooperation agreement exactly a year ago. This agreement aims to strengthen partnership between our two states. The Quebec office is here to build bridges between our communities and our government, and I hope the French Heritage Corridor Initiative could be a step forward in our collaboration. Finally, I'd like to thank Lisa and her team for having us today. I want to highlight your commitment and all your work you have accomplished so far regarding the French Heritage Corridor Initiative. I think to be all gathered today is an achievement by itself, and I look forward to our next collaboration. So moving right along, those were really nice words. Uh, thank you so much, John. And um, at this point, um, I'm amazed at how efficient your your speeches are that you have incredible things to say and it's going so fast that at the end of all of this i think we're going to have a good amount of time for our discussion this is good um so i want to keep things rolling along here uh now i have uh the pleasure of introducing uh the executive director of french heritage society who has come um to uh be here and uh really do appreciate that uh, coming from New York, but you know, don't be fooled. Jennifer Harlan is a Midwesterner. She's an Iowan and uh, has uh, spent quite a lot of time in Chicago. And I know that um, outside of just her duties as uh, officially as the executive director, that there's there's a lot of joy coming to the Midwest and seeing what's happening in her organization uh, that she leads and seeing firsthand these wonderful places, learning in a way that maybe as a Midwesterner like myself, who's been here my entire adult life, every day I learn something new from the French Heritage Corridor. So it's so great to have that constant uh, renewal. And it is something that also, I think, uh, gives us a lot of inspiration about how we can do a better job even with French Heritage Society. So I know collaborating with Jennifer going forth is just going to be extra great and I am so thrilled that she's here and uh, really um, look forward to hearing what uh, she has to say. So let's all welcome Jennifer. Hello everybody. And I was told to speak loudly. So if at some point that goes down, just someone go like that and I'll know that I need to speak a little louder. Uh, as Lisa shared, I'm the executive director of French Heritage Society and our headquarters is in, in New York City. We also have an office in Paris out of which we run uh, some of our programs. Um, but as she said, I have a strong connection to the Midwest because I was born in Iowa. I was educated at the University of Iowa, undergraduate and graduate degree in French. And um, I started my career in Chicago where I was so lucky as to work in the Francophone community. I was at the Alliance Francaise in Chicago for a little while and then also at the Delegation de Quebec in Chicago. So I, I really feel fortunate that I started my career that way and started my career in the Midwest. And it is an absolute pleasure, it's not really coming a full circle, but it's a way for me to go back to some of that and back to some of my roots. And I have been amazed in the 24 hours that I've been here despite my links and my knowledge of the Midwest, how much I've learned and the knowledge that I've gained in this short amount of time here, but I think equally important, the admiration and respect and understanding of how important the work that's being done here is, has been really fulfilling for me. And the day's not over as we know. So we still have some time left together here. And then this evening, 
just to tell you a little bit about French Heritage Society, um, some of you may be more familiar than others, but uh, for over 40 years, our mission has been to preserve the rich French architectural and cultural heritage in France and also in the United States. And there are three different parts to our mission that we um, work very hard on. The first is awarding restoration and cultural grants. And we have given over $14.3 million in restoration grants in our history to 670 projects. And in this room, I was so pleased to finally be able to put faces to some of the institutions that we have supported through our American grant uh, program. So I was able to, to meet Carol with the Fort de Chartres, the Bourbonnais, Michael, which I knew you in a past life in a way, but uh, we'll just say for this purpose, the Bourbonnais, and then also Bill Duke House, which is one of our really important projects this year. And both Bull Duke House and the Bourbonnet Log Schoolhouse were supported by all of French Heritage Society's chapters, which I think is particularly meaningful. The second part of our mission is that we have an education program. And through this education program, every year we select and support around 24 university students who are based in either France or the United States. And they are able to cross the Atlantic and participate in internship programs that are in some way, shape, or form linked to what they're studying and what they hope to aspire in their careers. And through the education program, some of these are shorter, some of them are more summer internship programs, and there are also longer term, meaning six to 12 month internships for students who are at the master's and doctoral levels, because we have found that that's a really good way for these students to gain an understanding and to be able to go out after they've completed their studies and promote the importance of preserving French architectural and, cult and cultural restoration. The last part of our mission is that we foster French American friendship. And what does that mean? In this particular setting, it means that we have 10 chapters in the United States, we have one in Paris, and every single one of them give us access to their geographic area. They are able to promote the mission, they are able to do it in a way that is in line with their um, their constituents, and they organize programs. Obviously, we all know the Chicago Midwest chapter, and but each of the chapters organizes programs in their local community, and uh, we also offer events and trips. Some are members' trips and um, galas and whatnot in different areas for people to participate in. The Chicago Midwest chapter the, when their French Heritage Corridor Initiative plays an extremely important role in strengthening the bonds between France and the United States. And it does so by bringing awareness to an element of French history that is perhaps not quite as well known here in the United States. It wasn't as well known to me. And I think that the efforts that are being done, the progress that's been made in such a short amount of time is extremely impressive. And really I salute you, Lisa, for everything you've done and your leadership team every member seems equally passionate, which I think plays such an important role in moving something like this forward. As Lisa mentioned earlier, French Heritage Society's involvement in this area began in 1993. And that was when our president at the time, Mary Solator d'Auvergne, who I, I don't know if she's still on here or not, but she visited the Mississippi Valley following the devastating floods there. She was a passionate advocate for this geographic region throughout her tenure. And we're all fortunate, and I know she shares this sentiment that Lisa and the French Heritage Corridor are really pushing this forward and bringing awareness and bringing success to this initiative. And she doesn't know if she's on here, but I, I'm in closing, I'm actually going to read a quote from her because I was looking through, it was a foreword that she wrote for a book uh, by Carl Eckberg about Charles Pierre de Haut de la Suisse de Lusière. And I found it so striking because it really summarized what struck her about this region and why it was so important to her. And I think she always speaks with eloquence and uh, passion and I am delighted to share this with you. She said, upon her first visit to St. Genevieve, culturally, I found an extreme emotional jolt, the profoundly moving shock of recognition when I heard a, child, a children's choir from St. Genevieve sing in French, very ancient Christmas songs that we sang at midnight mass during my childhood in my small village in the Berry region of central France. 
That touching testimony to the French presence as far back as the 17th century reinforced the notion of that shared cultural link, which is today slowly eroding even in our French country villages. That it remained alive in a small Mississippi Valley town was deeply moving. I think that beautifully summarizes the importance of the work that's being done by the French Heritage Corridor and how critical it is to protect and promote these cultural links between our two countries. So I thank you. I thank you on behalf of French Heritage Society, on behalf of French Heritage Society's Midwest Chicago chapter and of the French Heritage Corridor Initiative. We are all grateful for your support and grateful for all of the work that you're doing to help advance the initiative. And now I'm going to introduce the next speaker, if I'm not mistaken. Jim, who I was also delighted to meet in person yesterday for the first time, having known him on Zoom. Uh, Jim Paul, the FHC Illinois ambassador, who has played a critical role in developing and managing the French Heritage Corridor interactive map, as well as sharing the management of the French Heritage Corridor events calendar. He is an active member of the French Heritage Society Chicago Midwest chapter and a point person for the Bourbonnet Grove Historical Society First Log House Reconstruction, which received a 2022 FHS restoration grant. Merci, Jennifer. Bonjour, mes amis. He's always trying to find fault with my French. And so is Sylvette. So I'm dressed uh, as Noel Levasseur, one of the uh, Bourbonnais, Illinois pioneer settlers. He died in 1879, almost 80 years old. He was born on Christmas Eve in Saint-Michel Iamask, just southwest of Quebec and southeast of Montreal. He, um, along with two other French Canadians, Antoine and Francois Bourbonnet Sr. brothers, came into the Kankakee River Valley in the 1820s. They were the first Europeans in the area with maybe one other exception, Gurdon Hubbard, another fur trader. They interacted with the Potawatomi, Noel, Francois Bourbonnet Sr., married Potawatomi women. I'm not sure about Antoine. And um, the point I'm trying to make is that a pioneer is someone who explores or settles a new area. And we are pioneers as we are exploring a new frontier and settling a new frontier. The French Heritage Corridor. We've taken some first steps in that exploration. And we wanted in May of 2021, when we met in Prairie du Rocher, to create a platform, a presence in which we could um, share and network our organizations and sites and then the French heritage and culture that we so value. And we began to step onto that uh, frontier as we last year launched a website. So Ben, if you wouldn't mind, show the first slide. Thank you, Ben. We um, worked on this logo. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But the website is to be a, a platform to us for us to showcase and network our organizations and sites, and also publicize to the public who we are and what we do. It 
it's a way to illustrate our presence. Next slide, please. Well, I uh, have a little technological ability as I worked at the community college and websites. And so I learned how to hyperlink and I thought, well, we'll create an interactive map where we can place all of our organizations and sites over seven states. So I used, with Charles's permission, the map that he has on page Roman numeral 13 of his book. Well, that was good. Next slide, please. So I put red stars on the map and I hyperlinked them to historical societies, uh, to uh, uh, sites, French sites, uh, uh, French Native American sites, museums, and so on. And you see the blue triangle in southwestern Illinois and the blue triangle in northeastern Illinois denoting corridors. The uh, Cahokia to Kaskaskia Trail in southwestern Illinois and the French Canadian Heritage Corridor in northeastern Illinois. So I was just trying to play around with some ideas, but you see the map was good, but it didn't have all seven states fully included. Next slide, please. This is one of the uh, logos that we looked at, and I know uh, Lisa really liked this one because of that beaver, but the one that's in front of me is the one that was chosen. Next, please. You can go ahead one more, Ben. So last year, we launched the website as John Charles Foyer and his mother, Julie Kemper Foyer, cut the ribbon along with Lisa, launching the website as the first attempt to provide our presence to each other and to the public. A launching pad, let's say, a beginning point. Okay, Ben. And on the website, we had the map of interactive sites. You can see the different dots and their designation. The gold would be a general overview of the area of the historical sites, maybe a little video. The purple historic sites, museums in red, parks in green, a corridor or a trail in blue, historic sites in, I'm sorry, my, I'm colorblind. Uh, another shade of blue, and then Native American <laughs> and French and brown. Well, they were nice big dots, and that was good, but next slide, please. We decided to go with smaller dots, and since there were so many dots in clusters, we had a challenge there. So on some of the dots, like around St. Louis or Chicago, there are numbers on them showing how many historical sites or museums or historical societies that dot represents. So then you can zoom in, next slide please. And then you can zoom in further and further and the dots begin to separate. Next slide please. And the list of uh, events in the seven state corridor. So what I do with our uh, French Heritage Society intern in New York, Juliet right now, is every week send her an update of any new site that the ambassadors want me to add to the website or any new events. So I'll funnel that to Juliet, then she does her little magic and it becomes part of the website. Next slide, please. Again. So a little review. Um, wants you to think about is your organization or site on the map and in, in the correct spot. Uh, we have some glitches, especially around the St. Louis area right now. I don't know, it's like a Bermuda Triangle down there. I don't know what goes on in that area. But anyway, we're trying to make sure that the Missouri sites are in Illinois. What was that? <laughs> Thanks, Tandy. Okay, so please let me know. Don't be afraid to contact me. 
I don't care. You don't have to be an, uh, an ambassador in your state. You can be like Greg just sent me an email the other day. Well, don't, you know, don't forget about this little event and I'll get to it and put it in there. So just contact me uh, if you don't have, well, you should have my email from, if nothing else, the website. Okay, next, next one, Ben. And so make sure that all of your events are listed. Um, we do have an archive of events from last year, but they don't go past uh, September. I think beginning in September of last year, for some reason, there aren't, they weren't archived before September. So if we're missing an event, please let me know. Next slide, please. And always in, uh, suggestions on how to improve the website. So it's a launching pad and someday our media may go beyond this and, and, and this will be our basis though. This is our platform. This is the beginning and it gives us a, a commonality that I think we can all share. Next slide, please. So coming soon to the website, next, next slide or next point, uh, soon. Professor Randa Duvik will be up here uh, telling you about the module that she has created. Next slide, please. And within those modules, there's going to be a module for each state, as I understand, and Illinois will have us a module, the Illinois module. And uh, I've created, and it's in your packet of materials, Let's spend a weekend in Illinois' French Canadian Heritage Corridor. And this could be something that a website viewer could click on the Illinois module and see a specific tour of an area up in Northeastern Illinois where I live, 30 miles uh, from north to south along Interstate 57 maybe 20 miles, 15 to 20 miles east to west along that area, and a weekend tour um, place by place, what to do each day, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It's just one example of what we can do, and it's a beginning. It's all a launching pad, something to think about. And when we meet in July, the team will discuss this further. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you. So Jim is uh, articulates everything so well, probably much too modest. Um, he really had a vision that helped lead the way to developing this interactive map and uh, events calendar and is kind of the, the, the keeper of it. And um, we are very grateful to that because, um, you know, it's, it's not just a, a one person operation. This is a team and he plays a vital, vital part in, in this, uh, in our success. And it's becoming more and more, I've been told, talk louder. Uh, it's becoming even more user-friendly. So what we're really excited about now is that in addition to you know calling all of this up on your computer, it is now very mobile-friendly. And so on your, on your uh, portable, on your cell phone, you can go uh, about and really access all of these sites on the map, the calendar of events and uh, in just a moment or two, you'll see the uh, amazing modules and the, the, the first of what will be eight. So this first one is, is general and giving you general information about the entire seven state corridor. Um, and then we will continue working with uh, Professor Duvik to develop, as Jim said, one for each of our seven states. And that's where you all come in. We want to hear from you. So later today, um, after you've taken in a bit of the module as it's being presented to you, um, we do want to hear your impressions, but we also want to think forward about each of these seven state modules and tempt you to be um, partners in this. We want to hear if you have some vital information, 
if uh, perhaps Jim, Jim's uh, idea of having a tour. This could be applicable, not just for um, an individual, but even for tourism. Imagine you're taking a cruise on uh, the Mississippi and you get off at Cape Girardeau and you're told that, you know, it's less than an hour away. You can go to St. Genevieve, uh, Missouri and see this incredible place and have a lot of fun. And boom, here's a, here's a tour on your, on your mobile. If, if for some reason the uh, industry who runs cruise lines don't feel that they're equipped at this point to offer those kinds of uh, tours and organize them, this may be a way to start that process that people, they can you know, bring this to their attention and that they can then take it from there. And then perhaps this will inspire some, some businesses to, to pop up. I know in my uh, uh, other um, vocation, I do give some tours locally in Chicago. And hey, if I had this kind of information that Randa has developed uh, at my fingertips, all of a sudden I've got all kinds of juicy stuff to create really fun tours. And we're convinced that the work we're doing is, uh, as Professor Mann said, in terms of public history, that this is something that education and learning and having fun can go hand in hand. They don't have to be in um, ivory tower or even a, a traditional classroom setting. This is something that can allow us to do this sort of thing all kinds of places. And we're really hoping that this will also result in using the language itself, French, as an access point to learning about all of these wonderful places and having this be accessible to lots of people, not just English speakers, but French speakers. So you'll notice that we've really made an effort now to uh, reach out to our, our friends who want to utilize those skills, hone those skills here, or whose first language is French elsewhere. Um, enough about what I have to say. Let's hear what Randa has to say. And I would like to say that it has been really a pleasure working with Randa, getting to know Randa. She came to last year's conference, I believe virtually. And this year I'm so glad she's here in person and uh, has just become a vital team member of the French Heritage Corridor uh, initiative. And um, I'm very excited to invite her up. What we're going to do is share our screen uh, after you have a chance to say hello. I want you to be seen and then we'll share the screen and have the big like drum roll and uh, actually go live with this, this new feature that we offer. So come on up, Randa. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. Um, Hopefully you can see me. Uh, this is a better podium for tall people than short people. So I'll stand on my toes for a moment and then I'll go back down and the front row can't see me anymore, but that's okay. Cause I'm not the point, right? Um, thank you so much. Hello everyone out there in, in virtual land. Um, I'd like to take just a moment before we start. Um, could we have a round of applause for Lisa, please? I, I know the amount of work that she has gone to in our little part of the project. I don't know how many hundred emails have gone back and forth over just the last two weeks. And having run a, a, a small conference myself in the past, I know what a tremendous amount of work it is. And so thank you so much. Merci infiniment pour tout le travail. At any rate, wanted to be sure to start that way. Well, let me present myself. I'll go on my toes again for a moment. Um, I'm Randa Duvik, and I'm currently Senior Research Professor of French, Valparaiso University uh, in Valparaiso, Indiana, which is just south of the Indiana Dunes uh, National Park, right at the southern tip of Lake Michigan, about an hour outside of Chicago. Um, I retired from teaching uh, two years ago. Senior Research Professor is a designation that allows me to A, keep my office. I didn't have to move all my books home. 
Uh, B allows me interlibrary loan, which was really useful for this project. And am I at C or three? Uh, allows me Xerox machine and printer privileges. So it's a great, it's a great position. Yes, right? Um, I was born in Iowa near Dimwan, no relation to monks, but nonetheless. Um, my husband is from Wisconsin, uh, South Central Wisconsin. Um, I live briefly in Minnesota and now I live in Indiana. So I have lots of connections to French Heritage Corridor, lots of ways in which I sort of come in geographically. Um, thanks to all of those who uh, participated in putting this project together, um, Lisa, whose idea this, the modules were, the module was, uh, and who has guided its development. Thanks to the ambassadors also who have come on board fully and have been full of ideas and suggestions for making it much better uh, than it was when it first started out. Still, uh, I'm sure there are ways in which it can improve more, but it's infinitely better because of their help. So uh, my thanks to them as well. And in particular, thanks to Diane Hunter back here, um, whose very concrete and useful advice helped us to make sure that the native role is highlighted at least to some extent and that the native point of view is included because as we heard this morning and as we are, are conscious, that's so important uh, to, to um, um, include that point of view. Um, so a few words uh, about the beginnings of the project. I came on board this past winter to try to give um, some form to this idea of a module, an online module, which would be part of or linked to the French Heritage Corridor webpage that would be a series of informational web pages presenting the history of this area, of this region, of the corridor itself. And you folks know this, but as I have uh, presented on a particular part of the French Heritage Corridor, the Joseph Bailly part of it, um, I have learned that many, many folks know little to nothing about the French heritage of this region. Some of them know zero. Some of them can say, oh yes, Marquette and Joliet, and then that's it, it stops, right? So there is really a lot of educational work to be done for students, but also for the public in general. And so the, the whole uh, idea of, of public history is, is crucial. Sometimes folks know a little bit about their city or their town or their state, um, but they don't really know anything about La Nouvelle France back at the origins. And they know even less usually about the crucial role that was played by native people throughout the time of La Nouvelle France. So there is a need for information. Hence this project, this initiative, of the French Heritage Corridor to try to make some really pretty basic information easily available to whoever might want to learn about this heritage. Be they folks who are completely starting from scratch and know nothing, or be they folks who have a little bit of knowledge and want to deepen it, want to find ways in which they can broaden or deepen that, that knowledge that they have. So I come to this project as a person who has worked with the business records of Joseph Bailly, Joseph Bailey, as we call him, um, who was a French Canadian fur trader, who was the first non-native to settle in my county, Porter County in Northwest Indiana. Um, uh, reading um, one volume of his account books, which are held in our local Porter County Museum and which are in French, that was my entree into this universe of information and really the first, the, the moment at which I started learning about La Nouvelle France and um, all of the things that there are to know about the French heritage within this area. So I come to this project as someone who was a learner myself and whose entree was through that French language connection. And I also come to it as a person who is an educator. Um, I've been very active in teaching groups, my state teaching association, the National American Association of Teachers of French, local groups, um, working with teachers, and someone who is pretty passionate about trying to figure out how to make material of various kinds accessible to people. How do we um, help people learn about this cool stuff? 
whether that is simply the French language, whether it is uh, local history, whether it's archaeology, whether it's architecture, et cetera. Um, and I presented a number of times about this, what I call a, my sort of French language on ramp, the way in which I uh, came to know about this topic. So with this background as someone who was a learner myself and someone who is a teacher, um, when I was approached by Lisa, I started thinking, well, how do we present this material? How do we make it accessible? Um, I was a novice. What did I not know? The answer is a lot. I didn't know a lot. Um, how can we make this accessible to students, but also to adults, to learners, to the general public? So I started thinking about um, what is it that people don't know? And what are the basics that it's important for them to know? Oh my gosh. Wow. I've just been elevated here. Someone have a crown for me? <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, so first of all, then what don't people know? Second of all, what are the basics? What are the starting points that people need to know? We can't go into all of the detail, but where do we, what do, what do they need to know in order to start? What materials and approaches can be used to help people? And you folks here are experts, many of you, at least interested amateurs who know a, a bunch of stuff about one area or another. Um, and so what I was thinking about was, what can we provide that will be the springboard for people who aren't experts or who don't know a lot to help to really hook them? I just mixed my metaphors, didn't I? Springboard that will help to hook them. Anyway, you get my drift. What's, what's the springboard that will get them to say, hey, I want to know more about this? Um, so that was what I had in mind and uh, talked with Lisa about and, and uh, was thinking about as, as we put together the, the module. Um, and the module has just been finished. If I've, I've been thinking about it kind of as that canoe that got is, has just been launched into the river. And we think we have plugged all the holes. We think that we have got all of the, the, the various parts working. Uh, I think we are at about 100% right now. So this morning we were 99.9 .9 and I think we're 100% now, fingers crossed. So I guess then we get our, no, Lisa, you are yeah. putting on the thing, don't so, trip. No. And with my wedgies, I probably don't need. Uh, let's see. Good for me, not so good for her. Usually it would be great, but I have the higher higher heels on there today. Okay, so this should do it. Okay, let's hear some drum roll. <laughs> Woo! I'm gonna remove that green thing. Okay. okay. All right. Um, at this point, um, I, as, a, as a teacher, I was always telling my students, put those phones away, please. In the backpacks, no, not just in your hand. But there were a few times when I wanted them to have their phones out. And I would say, if you wish, it's okay uh, if you want to follow along on your phone. Uh, if, if that's easier for you to see, so this screen here is not always terrifically easy uh, to see. So feel free to go to French Heritage Society and then go to initiatives and take a look at French Heritage Corridor. And here we have the full page. We have the mission. This is was the pre-existing page. Here's the map that uh, was just mentioned that Jim was talking about. Whoops, or, sorry about that. I have my little trackpad set to work a different way. So I'm constantly gonna be going up instead of down, my apologies. Um, and then here are the wonderful set of events. And then we get down to the bottom and we see French Heritage Corridor Initiatives with the conferences and history module over here on the right. I will get to this module d'histoire en français a little bit later. We'll start in English. And there I'm going, scrolling the wrong way. 
So what we have essentially is a number of different pages that are intended to present different parts, different aspects of the French Heritage Corridor's history. And to start out, we have um, a sort of general history section that really comprises these two areas. One that's called French Heritage, the beginning, and then one that is called more French heritage. And I'll talk about them uh, uh, a little bit. And um, Lisa, please time me. I have absolutely no idea where I am in terms of time. So, okay, I'll, I'll just keep talking forever then. My students will tell you, I have no problem doing that. Um, so this first section introduces the French colonial presence in the French heritage corridor. And there we have it. This is a very general basic information of the coming of the French to North America. As you can say, as you can see, we can trace the beginnings to the 16th and 17th centuries. And um, Samuel de Champlain into the continent's interior important section on native partners. How do we know about this? Correspondence of the Jesuits, archeological investigations. And then importantly, we have, we say folks, what we know is from a European perspective. Let's be sure that we recognize that there is a native perspective as well. And you know this, it's different. So we have a, a link here and also in our bibliography that is gonna allow you to go directly to resources written by na various native folks. And this is um, from the Miami community blog, Miami uh, nation, and then the citizen Potawatomi nation, just a couple of examples. So you can, you can go there from here. Um, so that's the basics of the beginning then French presence remains, just a little hint of things to come. French presence did not stop after 1763, but indeed continued in a number of different ways. And um, I've tried as much as possible to put things like this link, which just takes you back to the map, um, but it's a very useful map and helps you to explore things um, uh, through those sites as well. So that's the first part of this kind of two-part general introduction. Michael. Those are just important words, important concepts. Something from, uh, as a teacher, I know students don't always read <clears throat> every word. So if you have your eye just drawn to those, those bold words, that's all that is. They are not links. On some of the other pages, there are links but they will all be indicated in blue. And obviously if you just mouse over them uh, or hover on them, you'll see that, but thank you. Yeah, they're, they're just important ideas. So that is the first very general page and more French heritage. Oops, there we go. Um, and this is the place where we barely, barely introduce each of the states. Um, if we had done justice to each of the states, this page would be so long, you would never stop, you would never finish scrolling through it. So we have intro really introductory material that talk about some important places, important people, important dates for each of the states. And in order to be completely uh, equal, we are just doing it alphabetically, right? which means we're gonna start with Illinois. And here we do have some links. We have some links, a uh, link to Bourbonnais. We have a link to uh, Fort de Chartres, for example. And we've also tried to liven it up with some images. So thanks to Jim Paul for, uh, for providing this and to a number of the ambassadors for providing really useful images uh, to help uh, liven up and illustrate the site. And we go to Indiana. I need to work on this one. It's just one paragraph. Um, Iowa's French heritage we have. 
here is Michigan. And for a couple of the states, I received from the ambassadors documents that were very quite long and quite extensive. And so that I didn't make the page too long, there are links that will allow you uh, for Michigan and for Minnesota and then for Wisconsin, we have uh, an additional uh, page to look at. So this link will allow you to uh, see more, I'll go there, more information on Michigan's French heritage with a lot of URLs, places that, that people can explore more. So thanks to Michael for providing that. A helpful go back uh, arrow. For Minnesota, we have the same thing, uh, a page that allows you to read quite a bit more about the French heritage of Minnesota. Helpfully provided by Rob Mann from St. Cloud State. So lots to, to go through there. Whoops. Um, Missouri's French heritage. This could have been really, 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 really long as well. Um, but um, we've, uh, we've uh, cut it a little bit short with, um, but have some links for this link for St. Genevieve links you to a whole pile of documents about St. Genevieve. So there, there is a lot there. And uh, we've tried to include, you can barely see this, but um, some of you are familiar with the music uh, by Dennis Stromat um, coming from uh, the Missouri French, uh, the Vieille Mine, the Old Mines uh, area. And so we've got links to a couple of YouTube uh, videos of performances of those. So uh, again, just a springboard, just a start to getting to know uh, uh, this heritage. And Wisconsin's French heritage, uh, I, will we be seeing this one tomorrow? I think we will. The Francois Vertefeuille House. Um, and here we have an extensive list of rec reference works um, on Wisconsin's mm -hmm. French history. And that had to go on a separate page along, uh, as well because Mary, uh, Mary Lise Antoine put that together. And we have uh, a lot of um, places that you can go uh, to see more information, books, articles, et cetera. So those are the two uh, basic history parts of the module. And I will attempt to go back up to, here we go. Um, our next part of the module, sorry for the noise when I click on it, but um, the fur trade, as we have been hearing, and as you know, was so instrumental in moving, uh, motivating the French to move into, to come into this area. It was the fur trade that, um, where the partnerships and relationships with the native people were most concretely lived out. Um, and so an explanation of the basics of how the fur trade worked seemed like an obvious choice. I had also learned in previous public presentations that I had done that most people don't know a lot about how it worked other than the fact that there were furs and they were traded. So uh, to go into a little more depth than that, <laughs> um, we, we put this together. Uh, again, with some images, including some provided, I don't know if you can see it there, but ones from the Port St. Joseph um, uh, archaeological dig, very, very useful to see what do they look like when archaeologists uncover them today, these remnants of the fur trade. Um, a couple of maps, look at all those arrows, which can't come close to um, uh, to summarizing all of the directions that the, the trade took uh, on the various waterways of the French uh, Heritage Corridor, but it's it, at least a beginning to help you visualize all of the movement that there was. Um, a section on furs and trade goods. What were those trade goods? Um, with some examples here and a picture of a beaver fur over on the right. And a very brief uh, mention of ways in which uh, they adopted um, many items from the natives who knew how to live here, who knew how to work, who knew how to travel. And so an, a brief evocation of that. And then added on at the end here, this was a great idea from Lisa. She said, we've got so many tra trade sites that can be visited. Let's remind people of that. So here is uh, some um, links to different fur trade sites where you can visit, see reenactors, see archeological sites, et cetera. 
Um, so uh, a nice way of sort of bringing that home uh, to people's lived experience today. And I'm going the wrong direction again. So apart on the fur trade, Next, we have, I could not resist putting this in there because as I said earlier, this was my entree into this whole world. Um, need to speak louder? Okay. Um, Joseph Bailey, Joseph Bailly, his homestead where he came to live in the 1820s uh, is preserved at the um, Indiana Dunes National Park. You can visit that homestead. Uh, and I, as I said, uh, one of his account books, one of 48 volumes, one of them is at our local museum, uh, the other 47 in the Indiana, Indiana State Library. And so what we've done here is taken just a few little excerpts. And this uh, is what my French teacher friends find the most fascinating is looking at the French language. Spelling is pretty different. Sometimes we have to just sound out the words, but we can tell what was bought and sold. We can also see this gorgeous handwriting over here. Uh, see if you can figure that out on your phone. Maybe you can even make it bigger, see if you can read it. Uh, so here we've got some trade goods that come directly from his uh, account book. We see here a list of the furs and skins that he brought in from one of the, uh, uh, one of the trading posts that he established throughout, at this time it was throughout Michigan. And here we see some of the goods that were just useful for folks, Europeans, traders, who were living out in uh, Le Désert, out in the wilds, out in the woods of Michigan. Uh, and obviously we see a sail here. So we know that we, we are reminded of the importance of waterways. So this is uh, a, a page that might start hooking people into thinking about the French language part of this endeavor. When I was a kid growing up in Iowa, my parents had um, a book of old maps, reproductions of old maps. And I used to love to look at the ones that were in French and notice what it was that the French people of the 16 and 1700s put on the maps and did their uh, tracing of waterways, et cetera, did it look the same as today? Not quite. So that was another way in which I was interested and hopefully um, my extrapolating from my experience is not too far off from at least some other folks' experience so that learning about and looking at old maps might also be a way to hook people in, might be that springboard to getting them interested in this. So what I have here is not a lot, but um, down here at the bottom, uh, links to some maps that you can see. I, they are reproduced here, but even better, if you go to their online sources, you can enlarge as much as you want uh, and really read what's on there. So if, if you are a little intrigued by the maps, I encourage you to explore this. And this part, as a teacher, I just couldn't help myself. I put in some sort of vaguely educationally um, uh, related activities, some sort of questions. Ask yourself this, think about this. What do you think about this? What do you notice here? What do you notice there? Um, and I will just click on this. Hopefully this will work. Okay, it's coming up as a PDF, which is fine. Um, and you can see that on one of these maps, Some things are written here. It's really small. I'm sure you folks in the room can't see it. It's really small. But there's the, um, some uh, language about Le Père Marquette and Joliet and uh, some other language down here, which I've then translated. And uh, you can see what is indicated on that map and see what they thought was important to tell about what was going on in this region. So you have one of those that's in English and one that's in French, uh, clickable from this page on old maps. Um, and now the other part that of course I could not uh, eliminate, could not leave out, teaching materials. Um, I was at a gathering a number of years ago where the then ambassador, uh, French ambassador was speaking 
And he said that one of the things that he had learned, and I thoroughly approved this, you will know why. One of the things that he had learned was that French teachers in the United States are the best ally of the French language and the best ally of France, of Canada, of Haiti, of any French speaking country or area. We love it. <laughs> we are francophile and we are creating the next generation of francophile. So my, ex my excuses, my pardon uh, to those of you who are not French teachers, historians, you're good too. Uh, you know, other folks, you're, you're good too. But um, this, is, this is, I think, a particularly interesting way and, and fruitful way of trying to create that generation, that next generation of people who will be fascinated by this and whose entree, like mine, might come through the French language. Um, so this is specifically for French teachers, um, although anyone can look at it and learn from it. French learners can do that as well. But it has a series of five texts which are written in pretty simple French, and then some activities that teachers can use as is or more likely will adapt for their classes um, and that are um, uh, calibrated to the national standards of teaching of French. So we've tried to, to cover that as well. So uh, if you know French teachers, um, let them know about this as well. And then finally, I will end with no, I won't quite end with this, but for further exploration, there we, whoopsie, oh, did I just do the wrong one? Okay, here we go, further exploration. This is the bibliography. As a professor, you've got to have your bibliography, right? Um, but we have some websites, including some uh, that we've uh, included for the native point of view, as well as a pretty extensive list, thanks to all of the ambassadors who sent me things. Uh, some are uh, scholarly, but most are for general public. So anyone who wants to read further, have at it. Here are a number of sources for you. And our Wisconsin history sources, uh, we have here as well, if you want to consult that specialized bibliography. So I said, finally, it's not finally, parce que il y a le français, il y a le côté français, and this is something that, that as I said, Lisa really said, this is important. I said, oui, je suis tout à fait d'accord. So we have the module d'histoire en français, avec tous les textes traduits en français. J'espère qu'il n'y a pas de faute. I hope there are no mistakes in the French. Let me know, francophone. Uh, let me know if you find anything and, and I will correct them. I did, by the way, have this read over by uh, a, a friend and colleague of mine who is herself from Nantes uh, and teaches French at Lake Central High School. And she read through this and made a few corrections and a few stylistic comments. And she said, Rana, I didn't know any of this. This is wonderful. So, okay, we'll start a little evangelization, right, from that, okay. Um, so for French teachers that you know, they can certainly encounter this in their language. And you'll find exactly the same thing. Here's our general introduction, going very fast. Hope you, I don't, you don't get dizzy. Here is the Patrimoine Français des États, en ordre alphabétique, toujours, les mêmes informations. Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin. Uh, la traite des fourrures. I'll go very fast here because you've seen this in English. Uh, but as again, again this, the same information, but put into French. Voilà. Something exciting is happening behind me. Okay, great. Let me know if I need to know anything about it. Um, we have Les Contes. <laughs> les Contes du Traiteur de Fourrure. La, uh, oh. So, same information. Uh, the Carte Française Ancienne, same thing. Martériel pédagogique and pour aller plus loin. Je n'insiste pas. Um, those of you have your phones with you, you can uh, explore this during the break. No, uh, explore, don't, don't explore it during the, the uh, conversation, but during the break, uh, certainly do. 
Um, so that is what we have for the module, as, as Lisa has said and, and other folks uh, have alluded to. More modules are planned. I'm thinking they're not all going to be quite as big as this one. I hope they're going to be a little smaller. Otherwise, next 10 years of my life are mapped out. Um, but it's been such a learning experience for me. It's been wonderful for me to get to know virtually and now in person the ambassadors and the other folks who are part of this project. So thanks for your support. Evangelize, spread the word. We are hopeful that this will be useful um, in all, to, to people from all walks of life. Uh, anyone who is interested in learning about this, we hope that it's written at a level uh, and is engaging enough that they will be interested in using it as a springboard or a hook or whatever metaphor you want to use uh, to get them really interested in the heritage of the French Heritage Corridor. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Well, that was pretty exciting. J'ai dit très bien fait, Randa. Brava. Really, really great. And I saw in person a lot of people uh, either following along on their uh, mobile devices or checking emails, not sure which one. Um, but I, I think that there was a lot of engagement and that was really, really great to see. I, I know that it's something that's going to be uh, very usable and I'm just so excited. It's, it's a tremendous accomplishment. It helped us be better because it is uh, something that has translated into uh, much more usable on that mobile device. And oh, speaking of ice, uh, anyway, um, piggybacking on what uh, Yannick Tagan shared with us with this vision that, you know, as he sees it, we have this one pillar of education, another of tourism. And these two, pillars are things that the modules very much address. And so our next speaker, um, our plane cleanup over here, uh, and I know he's up to the task. He was the best photographer. He got all of us uh, doing some fun, silly stuff outside during our lunch break. And um, that, that definitely broke the ice. And once again, I keep hearing ice, but, uh, I, I am very delighted um, to introduce Drew Nussbaum from uh, Wisconsin Tourism, who uh, is here to share with us some insights that he has from a career of, of promoting Wisconsin and kind of, you know, considering how the French Heritage Corridor and our aims uh, fit within that context. And I think from that and his wisdom, we can apply that to uh, all the things we do going forward from our own home states, but definitely as a collective. So let's welcome Drew. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, I appreciate it. Anyone that knows me well, some of you have seen me speak before, keeping me on the podium is a challenge let alone in front of a lectern. So um, hello, everyone online. I appreciate you there as well. I want to say hello to all you guys. And then I'll go back to talking to these folks in a minute, but we can have a conversation for a while. Anyway, no, I, I seriously want to thank you much. Um, it, it's not only awesome to be here and to get a chance to listen to all of the information that you're presenting, the new website, phenomenal. I mean, I, I, it's really impressive to see the research you have, the work you're doing um, I've learned a lot. I really have. It's been an amazing morning here to just to listen to everybody in the collaboration. Thank you for the conversations at lunch. Um, I arguably have one of the best jobs in the state of Wisconsin. I am one of the three regionals in our state that gets to go out every day and meet with folks, meet with businesses, meet with destinations, meet with organizations, and, and help to catalog all of these wonderful resources we have here for the purposes of obviously making them a destination that people want to visit. But I also see the big picture in this, that we are really the front lines of economic development. If you love an area, all of you that are, are 
across the, the, the state, across the country, across the world that are with us today or online. Um, you are where you're at because at some point in your life, in your career, you've chosen that's the place you want to live. And maybe it started with a visit. You just decided, you know what, I, my career lines up with this great place. And it really comes together. So it is, in my opinion, everything is about a visit, live, work. It's really part of a bigger picture. Um, I, again, as I mentioned, there's only three of us in the state of Wisconsin that, that do this. So I'm the western side of the state. I think I'm kind of biased. Um, not only do I get this beautiful scenery in Mississippi River, I get the Driftless area of Wisconsin, and I can talk about Driftless all day long. Um, so it's really kind of a blessing to have this beautiful scenery every single day in my windshield as I travel across the state. Um, I also think it's awesome to welcome you here on behalf of the state of Wisconsin. Say welcome to Wisconsin. It's, good. it's awesome to have you here. I hope you enjoy your time. I hope that uh, in, for those of you that are in the virtual world, if you haven't been here, give me a call. We're going to get you here. I want you to come spend some money with us too. So enjoy your time. I, I think it's awesome. Not only are you here for your conference, but you're here for the 350th celebration of the discovery. I think that's pretty outstanding. Um, and, and again, and, and, and where's the lady that's just speaking? Where are you at? Grant? Say, say Marquette and Joliet again. No. Oh, man, it's beautiful. Say that again. I do not speak French, but that is awesome. You know, my, 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 my Swiss heritage and my six years of German and, and through, it's not paying off today a bit, I'm just going to say. So all of, all of the French you were speaking, uh, it was beautiful. I, it sounds great. Yeah, we. Oui. Uh, <laughs> Um, as it was meant, I, I work for the Wisconsin Department of Tourism, but it, you probably know us better as our brand of Travel Wisconsin. Um, for one, thank you for putting the logo on your on your agenda for today. It's on the back there, so it's a great reminder. When you came in today, you've got a white bag right on there, nice big and blue. There's the logo, Travel Wisconsin. Cheap, shameless plug. I want you to check that site out. I want you to look at all of the wonderful things we have to see, do, and experience here in Wisconsin. The uh, the website's kind of interesting. Um, again, we are a state agency, so that is the official Travel Wisconsin. That is the official site to promote travel in our wonderful state. Um, even though we are a, a, a small budget of marketing, when it comes to all state sites in the United States, we have over 10 million page views a year to Travel Wisconsin. And one of those reasons that our views are so high is because we have really purposely designed that site to be a catalog, an inventory of all of the resources that we have. Um, it's a lot of work, but, and I'll talk more about the collaborations we have. And I think that goes into the discussion. A lot of what I heard here today was the discussions about, you know, moving forward with, there, there was talk about advocacy with the Uniman legislators and local folks. Um, that really is the forefront of what my job is every day. So I very much appreciate those comments. Um, tourism is big business. Restoration goes into that, piece of it as well, but tourism, bringing people here to recreate, all of you spending time here in Prairie du Chien for a couple of days, this is tourism. Um, we just celebrated announcing our economic numbers just a week ago. 2022, economically, was the best year we ever had in the state of Wisconsin. $23.7 billion of economic impact direct that, that tourism had in this state. Um, and as an industry, again, when I take it back to that actual workforce, bringing people here to visit and maybe even end up working, the tourism industry in the state employs over 111 million people. Or, uh, sorry, no, um, 175,000 people. Yeah, no, no, sorry. Sorry, 175,000 people, but 111 million visits that come into this state as a result of that number. Eh, I got my numbers back. That's all right. Yeah. Any of you that know me know that it's not the first mistake I've made. Where do landmarks and history fit into that? We track very carefully all of our attractions, all of our, what are the reasons you come here? In the top 10, we always find landmarks and historic sites. And they're usually in that five and six range. So they're right in the middle of it. But when that's pretty impressive, you know, the discussion is, is history, is restoration, is preservation, is that a vital part of the tourism model of bringing visitors here? So in order to get 111 million visitors to come here, yes, it has to be a vital part of when they say that that is a vital part. Now we can't do this alone. If it wasn't for the Wisconsin Historical Society, and I can't say enough about you guys, what you do to preserve, catalog, operate, you know, the Villa Louis and all the other sites in the state of Wisconsin. Um, if it wasn't for them operating those sites and our ability to pr promote them 
collaboratively, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't, we wouldn't have that ability. Would there be an operation locally that could actually operate these historic sites and keep them going? So again, that collaboration with the state. Um, taking it even further, when you came into Prairie du Chien, well, I don't know if you came across the bridge through Iowa or how you came in, but if you saw where the four lanes are on opposite sides, there's a welcome center right downtown. That's actually also operated by the Prairie du Chien Chamber of Commerce and Area Tourism. Um, it is a Travel Wisconsin Welcome Center. So we have a collaboration with Prairie du Chien's officially to promote the state through that, that corridor right there when you come in there. So there's always great staff. When you go back to Travel Wisconsin and you look at all the inventory we have, it's those local partners putting the inventory on the site. So while we have thousands, tens of thousands of things on our site, that is all work that's being done locally through the Convention and Visitors Bureaus, the Chambers of Commerce, the Historical Society, even our other partner agencies of transportation and Department of Natural Resources, US Fish and Wildlife at the national level. There's a lot of collaboration that goes into making sure that inventory. So I appreciate all the work that goes into your site to getting those links in and those pictures and that write-up and that information is phenomenal, the work that goes into that. So I do wanna applaud you that that's no small task when you go to having that all of that inventory on there. Um, the other aspect of this is how do all of these things interact? How do they cross over to one another? We're talking about French history, French corridor, French culture, and the discovery of this area. Um, but then when you look out the window, you know, there's the Mississippi River. Why were, why were they exploring? Why were they following that path? Well, there's the Mississippi River. The other hat that I get to wear is uh, there's an organization that represents here in Wisconsin, but also all the states, all the way to Louisiana, the Mississippi River Parkway Commission. I've been the liaison to that commission for many years. Um, within that, we have a Great River Road Committee. So the road itself has a separate marketing entity. Um, so you can you see all these pieces of the puzzle that connect that ability to promote an area and to make it fluid so that people realize all of these experiences. The Villa Louie plugs in because it's along the Great River Road along the Mississippi River and it's in Prairie du Chien and there's these great businesses here. And then you can travel further up and you can see all the rest of the history and the culture. Um, again, when you talked about, there was comments this morning about the collaboration. Um, one other aspect that I, I, I wanna definitely hit on and I don't wanna underscore is that relationship beyond just all of you in the room. We, we've got representatives here from foreign countries, from, from Canada, from America, from other states, other cities. I think that's wonderful. Here in Wisconsin, it's, it's a constant uh, a challenge sometimes to even communicate at a local level. Do your city councils know all the work you're doing to promote this area and to bring visitors here and, and develop economic development? At the county levels, at the province level, do, we, do they know the work that's being done? Our elected officials within the state of Wisconsin. Um, one of the benefits I do have in tourism is that we're a non-regulatory state agency. In other words, we don't carry a badge, we don't issue permits or fines. That makes us the fun tourism folks. You know, we're the happy people. We don't come in and get you in trouble for anything. Um, but I also get to pick up the phone and I can talk to state senators or state representatives or other state agencies at will, and, and that's perfectly fine. It doesn't violate any protocol or policy for our agency. And again, there's many times that those discussions, of course, are all about, I'm working on a project with this group or with this group, and they, they've got a question as far as the, the regulation or the licensing, or they're having a challenge, can you help with this? Or even better, we're having an event. Um, when I talk about the Great River Road, two years ago, that was, a, as we call it, we kicked it up a notch. It became an all-American road, which is a, a higher classification. So you've got your, your, uh, your, your historic roads, and you've got your byways, and your scenic byways, and then this became an all-American road, which is just another higher definition of what that road is all the way across America. We held events all in all eight counties for 250 miles of this wonderful road two years ago. We had an event in every community almost, and we invited our legislators. We invited all our elected officials, and we said, this is why you're here, is to see the work that's being done, the collaboration being done, and also that helps with the support because it is a public private in many of these aspects. And it keeps that understanding that there may be times where our tax dollars need to be supporting the private sector. So can we work together on this? Um, one other hat that I've been blessed to wear um, for many years, and, and this has come up as well, is obviously the Native American 
integration and, and collaboration that exists within French culture and tourism. Um, for five years, I was actually appointed as the, uh, the tribal liaison for the state of Wisconsin. We have 11 Native American tribes in Wisconsin. Um, and and it, it definitely can be a challenge because they, they're all different backgrounds or many of them are, uh, are Lake Superior Chippewa bands and different ones. Uh, which interestingly, here's the only time that my that my ability to speak anything close to French worked out for me. Um, I could tell when I took elected officials to anything like Le Coup de Ray, and I wouldn't tell them how to pronounce it before they gave a speech, and I would just wait to see if they did their homework. And it was Lac Cuda Aurelius. Nope, not really, but close enough. Thanks for playing. Um, it was, you know, it was kind of a limit, but when you saw that relationship, and then where did that name come from? You know, clearly there's French culture, you know, in that Ojibwe name and how did that become? And then the Ojibwe becoming Chippewa, you know, I mean, there's so much when you put all the history together and how those messages, but I, it was a blessing for me because having that position and then we, we I work differently with a couple of tribes that are actually from outside of Wisconsin that have very significant history and culture here as well. Um, one fairly recently, as you go up the Great River Road here, just north of here in Vernon County is, is a town called Genoa, the Genoa Fish Hatchery, operated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, just across the road on the, on the shores of Lake or of, uh, uh, Mississippi River was a battle that was fought called the Battle of Bad Axe. The Sac and Fox tribe out of Oklahoma, which had their ties here. If you take Sac at that point, it was, you know, it's really translated with Sauk. We have Sauk County, so we actually we pay homage to that name here and that tribe. But the Battle of Bad Axe was fought right there, right across the road on the banks of, of Mississippi River. It's a very unfortunate story to tell in the history of our state in a, as, a, as a nation. But when we reached out and worked with the tribes and said, we, we need to tell the story properly. We need to make sure it's interpreted properly in this welcome center, in this visitor center. Um, at that time, I was a tribal liaison. I actually got to go to Oklahoma. And I learned more about my state and some of the things that happened by going to another state and working with another tribe than I'd learned in my own four walls. Um, but it helped to tell that story. And it was, and, and I realized we're talking now, you know, here the 350 years of discovery of exploration of the area. And I'm talking to the Native Americans and I'm hearing about thousands of years of culture. So it really put it into perspective to me, the timelines of how we're talking about this and telling that story properly, respectfully, um, it, it really is outstanding, and I, I enjoyed that as well. And it's a it's a continuing topic. I believe this gentleman here, you know, there's a lot of injustice been there, but things continue to happen. You know, there's there's challenges with lack of flambeau right now. Um, there's uh, you know with the Fond du Lac tribe out of Minnesota, there's property that's just been returned back to them in Douglas County up near Superior in Wisconsin. So it is a a, a topic that happens a lot. Um, but one of the you know the other piece of the history of it is. Look at that big picture all the time. How do we take this wonderful piece of French history and culture and, and, and conservation and restoration? And where do those, where does it tie in? And all these other communities in Missouri, we were talking at lunch and it was a great, you know, where can we, all of these things, where do they intersect? And where can you bring people into the equation to say, you know, my story lines up with your story? And your story lines up with their story. Let's put it all together and let's make one big experience out of this. Um, it, is, it is awesome when you see history as one of the top 10 reasons that 111 million visitors come to Wisconsin is because history is in that. And when it's experiential and if it's educational, it has a huge win. People do want to experience their history and learn. And it's not just from an aging demographic. Um, we, you know, in our main promotional aspect of Wisconsin, it's 25 to 45. That's who we promote to on a regular basis. That's the bulk of our marketing messages because we know nobody's getting any younger. That's the other thing. We know that if we get them at 35, we'll have them at 45 and at 45, we'll have them at 55. And before long, they have gray hair on their head. And I know how that works. Um, we have a lot of wonderful things here in Wisconsin that are first. One thing I did want to, I, I want to point out to today on the calendar is June 15th. And if you're an American, you know that yesterday was Flag Day in America. And that is a celebration of our flag and our culture. Do you know where that started? History buffs. It started right here in Wisconsin. The first one was celebrated when? 1785. We weren't barely a nation and we had the first Flag Day in Wisconsin. There's so many firsts here. 
Anybody here into racing? Anybody an auto race fan? The first auto race was in Wisconsin. And you want to know when? The state of Wisconsin offered $10,000 to the inventor of a machine that could move from Green Bay to Madison under its own power. The race was won by Alexander Gallagher of Oshkosh. The vehicle's average speed was six miles per hour. That was in 1878. The first auto race was here in Wisconsin. Did you notice that we are just off of Highway K? Did you notice Wisconsin? Those of you that are from out of state notice that we like to use letters at the county level. They're on County K. You know where the first numbering system for highways was? Here in Wisconsin. And then the federal government took the numbers and started numbering their highways. So to get even at it, we just put letters on it. And if you get a lot of, if you time it out right, you'll find where it spells out fun words in some areas of the state because they line up with one another. Um, ladies, the women's suffrage movement started in 1919 right here in Wisconsin. This is the first state to ratify that amendment. Why do I point these things out? Because these are such cool things that show all the unique history we have. And this is why I love what I do here in Wisconsin is to intertwine all of these. And it doesn't just stop with just unique aspects of that. When you look at the actual preservation and ecology and environmental work, the nation's first watershed project in 1933 was just up the road in Vernon County, the Coon Valley or Coon Creek watershed. And there's an interesting story to discover there. There's a Kickapoo Valley Reserve just up the road. But again, preservation, restoration, economics, environmentalism, it all comes together in this great state. So I'm so honored that you asked me to come here today to talk about a few things. I thank you so much for being here. I hope you come back. This is count for number three. So about, we'll let you go somewhere for a couple of years, about five or six. I hope to see you back in Wisconsin. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you very much, Drew. I hope that uh, we'll be seeing the French Heritage Corridor website on Wisconsin Tourism's site, um, because that's really how, how it's got to work. You know, we all have to um, work together, and that is what we really, as the leadership team, have discussed and determined that our stakeholders, in addition to the stewards of these sites, be it a local historical society, a state-run uh, historical society, a state park, a national park, what have you, it also has to be partnered with the tourism industry, the, these bureaus of tourism, starting at our local levels and moving up regional, statewide, and understanding that even beyond that, oftentimes, there's that opportunity that French Heritage Corridor offers that's unique, that we can feel linked by the river system itself. And we can use that as a means to impress upon our legislators and our elected officials and other leaders to support what's happening in one state by coming from another state and coming on board to a regional kind of uh, vision. And eventually, because of what's happening, the strength in the Midwest and putting that awareness back in the fold about French heritage and this untapped resource. Let's be honest, it's there, but it really hasn't been tapped into in the magnitude that it should be. Once that starts to happen, we're going to have that easier link to our friends in the North, in Canada, and all the way down to the Gulf, just as the French did. They kept going down that Mississippi River, right? So eventually all of the pieces are gonna fall into place, but we have to do the work here first. And this piece with tourism, not just the aim of bringing the tourism here, but using 
tourism as a business model, like what Drew has explained, this is a liaison to our legislators, to our leaders who make the difference in our lives. And this is an economic driver. It should start to be looked upon as such. It should be implemented into strategic planning from cities, from regions. This is something that we are offering. We obviously are passionate. We are rolling up our sleeves. We're working. We're providing tools for all of you, not just the average person who is interested in history, but our leaders and our business leaders who can also tap into this. So our hope is, is that we can take this to a level that will come back and become something that unites us in a way that we haven't really developed up to this point. And these are, you know, big visions, big, big ideas, but I think they're attainable. And um, I had a very nice conversation with uh, Father Hyde from the Archdiocese of Chicago during lunch. And, you know, I, I learned so much from him, but I also learned that we have a lot in common. Not only do I live down the street from him, <laughs> uh, but, you know, he was throwing around names. Oh, sure. You know, Ralph Freeze, I know that name. He was, you know, behind the 1973 uh, Expedition 2. And that also uh, was something that got him excited. He also has visions of how we can work together. You know, there's so many different leaders of communities. They could even be uh, religious leaders. The, this doesn't have to be a religious thing, but these are part of the community. We have pillars of our community that we all have to tap into. And I think just our example today of getting together illustrates that it's really possible and we just have to keep on moving. So at this point, we've got a, a nice half hour carved out for ourselves, Ooh, uh, ice, flies, what's going on here, um, that we can resume that wonderful conversation that we started this morning. Um, I would like to uh, offer just a couple comments um, from our friend from the DuSable Heritage Association who shared uh, so many lovely, um, personal accounts, but also coming uh, from Chicago uh, to, uh, or not really from Chicago, from, from, uh, from Milwaukee, uh, but coming to represent the DuSable Heritage Association in Chicago. DuSable, though, is a complex character, and that guy really was uh, factoring throughout the Midwest, and I think is a nice symbol of this kind of blending of heritage and uh, linking different cultures and cultural um, experiences that, that really does represent what French heritage is today. And um, unfortunately, Mark Rosier, who is our newest leadership team member, uh, who is originally from Haiti uh, and who did write the definitive book about Dusab is uh, was not able to come today, um, but he has also offered uh, a lot of insights in his uh, you know short amount of time he's been officially involved with us, and we do very much value uh, working with the Haitian community and uh, in, invite that consulate as well to join the fold because that is another key key part to this story in the seven states that make up the French Heritage Corridor. It's not just Dusab, it's plenty of other people that come from uh, what is now Haiti that were in the uh, Midwest, that they were working in the mines, sometimes as slaves, uh, but not always. And certainly it's not just a story about slavery, it's about the people and their lives and and subsequently, after they were not slaves, they were still uh, contributing to the story. So finding those voices and giving that 
a platform is also very much about what we're trying to achieve. And so the idea of inclusivity, basically no one is left out. All ages, all walks of life, whether you're French, whether you're not, there is a place that we can come together. So now I invite everybody else to uh, give some thoughts. And if you have a question or a comment, I really do invite that. Uh, anybody uh, in our virtual aud audience or uh, 22 comments? <laughs> well, I better read fast. Um, okay, well, I'm hearing good positive things about the module. That's very good to hear. Um, oh, I see a comment about uh, bike tours. Yes, there's all kinds of ways that we can, it doesn't have to be on foot or in, in a car. Uh, certainly, bike tours is a great idea. Bike Wisconsin. Okay. Um, let's see. Ooh. Uh, okay. So am I putting everybody to sleep? So in the morning, we had all these people who wanted to say something. Did we run out of, uh, yeah, Mike? I, I do, but some of them, some of them are like, what's he saying? You know, like, <laughs> I think it's when Michael made his comment and I didn't uh, repeat the question, perhaps. Um, okay. Oh, thanks. I'm like, glad you like our logo. I love it too. Oh, there's a question. I'm going to repeat, unless you'd like to come up here, you're welcome to. So, so it was a, a point with the question that uh, what Mary Elise uh, brought up this morning in terms of uh, the concern that there's a lot of people who are attracted to these historic homes and buying them to use as Airbnb or as a vacation home. And in certain areas, this could be a problem because it reduces the housing community and the affordable housing community. Then there's a question of how do you get enough workers to support and what could be done? Uh, you know, I would think from from the get go that that's a legislator got to get in front of them. But Drew's ways raising his hand if you want to come up and talk or if you want to just. Just because our virtual people can't hear you. Well, the virtual people cannot. Yeah, so come on, come on down. Yeah, so here comes Drew. It, it, it is actually a topic that ironically, the, the, maybe not ironically, but coincidentally, the Department of Tourism, actually, I'm very involved in. Um, there has been an explosion of short-term rentals over the, especially over the last few years. Um, and interestingly enough, here in Wisconsin, there's actually been legislature, uh, legislative work to, uh, we have room tax here, so it is now a taxable entity, so they are paying the, the, the room tax fees so that can be used for tourism promotion. However, um, as we work with economic development groups, there is a significant discussion of how far is too far. You know, if you do not have any homes left to sell, you can't grow your workforce, you can't grow your, your residency. So I strongly urge local municipalities to address this. And one, do they have a policy? Mm -hmm. Do they have you know, any type of regulation, I'm not necessarily a regulatory guy and I don't always preach to it, but do you have a way to at least inventory how many short-term rentals you have? Um, what are you doing? Are you keeping an eye on it? Is it licensed? I always think that they should be licensed so you can keep a track of who it is. If you do end up, you know, having nothing but short-term rentals, yes, you'll never have a house that you can ever buy. Um, and there are areas in the state where that has happened. So I do believe you need an even balance. You need to make sure that 
you at all times take a look at it. One, do we need more workers? And I think that question is pretty much yes, almost everywhere in the state of Wisconsin. So the question then becomes, where's the tipping point? How many, you know, you don't want to necessarily, we need lodging too. We need more places where visitors to stay, but we do need the residency, we do need homes. Um, so you do have, I think it goes back to the local uh, municipality that they have to have an idea on that. They have to look at it, pass ordinances or rules that address that locally to regulate it to, in their best of interest. Um, and, you know, I mean, there's no easy answer to that um, because it is an economic engine. I mean, it, you know, there are places in the state where you can make a lot more money buying a house and renting that house out for thousands and thousands of dollars a week than you can living in it or selling it. Um, so it is, it is a, you know, it is a, it is a business, uh, but I do think like anything, it's got to have rules. So I don't know if that addresses this, but um, it, just so you know that it is something that from an economic development standpoint, from the Department of Tourism, local municipality, it is something that is a, is a significant discussion here in this state. So. Thank you for that, Drew. I hope that sort of answered your question that obviously uh, we've got to rely on policymakers. Uh, of course, and and at the same time, uh, you know, when we are promoting restoration, preservation, and tourism, at the same time, it's really the the local constituency who really controls legislation and who they elect to govern. So, it, it, you know, that's something that outsiders at this point cannot control. But certainly, these partnerships, those local people are the the avant-garde they're the ones that that know what's going on and of course working together so accessing your state ambassador you know you've got mary lee's you've got her ear she's the wisconsin fhc's ambassador and those are those are your you know first points of contact and of course if there's something that can be done that's helpful that will be relayed to the rest of, of the leadership team of French Heritage Corridor. But a lot of times it's a matter of, uh, just as Drew said, there's gotta be a balance. So there's gotta be something in the communities also in their own leadership to understand uh, that, that this is something that they need to work on balancing. But we're hopeful that they'll recognize what we have to offer as one of those tools in helping to do that balancing. So that's the hope. What else, guys? What else can we cover? Yes, I've got a few hands over here. Come on. Oh, okay. I have to come back through. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Okay. So Charles has uh, observed that although we did have uh, somebody of uh, local leadership signed up to come, something must have come up. They are not here. And observing that no local leadership is here, can the uh, tourism, can someone like Drew or someone from Wisconsin Tourism uh, take this up as? a way to promote protection, recognizing that this is an endangered area. 
this we've acknowledged that this is a significant place and an asset in many ways to the state of Wisconsin. And knowing that and local leadership may not be doing all that they could do, what else can be done? Can the state of Wisconsin step in and advocate? What can they do? Uh, that's a question. And uh, Charles is, you know, get down to business kind of a guy. So he likes to, uh, you know, uh, not just talk in hyperbole, he wants to see action. So it was a call to action. And and Val, yes. Hmm. So uh, Val in the audience observed that at, at the hotel she's staying at locally, uh, it was pretty much full. And so her question is, well, what's bringing everyone here? From what I understand, uh, some of it was our conference, but there's also a wedding uh, that they're hosting. So there's, there's that. Now, th there could be a reason that they came because somebody's from Prairie du Chien. But it could be that they know it's beautiful and they just wanted to come here. We don't know. We'd have to do more uh, checking. But that was the question. Exactly. And, and finally, if they're not looking to camp out, this is a very, very big weekend in this community because it is the weekend celebrating the 350th anniversary of uh, Marquette and Juliet. So uh, there's a uh, rendezvous where we have on the island a whole bunch of people set up, uh, campsites, et cetera, um, reenacting groups, but there's also people just here to enjoy and to partake. So they may be staying at the local hotels. Good point, Ryan. And Ryan has another point, yes. I'm bringing Ryan up. He has some good points. I've got I've got some at least real world uh, responses to Charles here. Um, so yeah, you know, speaking of WalMarts and, and French Heritage, uh, the Walmart here. What was it? The Gagne Cabin was that the one that the Gagne Cabin that got hit by Walmart? Um, <laughs> uh, despite Al Reed's best uh, attempts to. Uh, salty site with uh, arrowheads to prevent it, I should mention. Um, with these local rural communities, what I found is that you've got to educate them. Uh, it, there, it, you can have all the tourism dollars you want to talk about. You can say, hey, we're bringing in a lot of tourism dollars. But if you're a landowner who owns one of these sites, you know, saying that, you know, if you can hang on for a while, this will be a, a, a you know, 10, 20, 30 year uh, heritage tourism thing for the community they're not interested in that you've got to have them personally committed to preserving the culture and the history of their local community and that's what sells here that's what sells in rural wisconsin it's, it's, it's saying that you know this is prairie to shane you have pride in prairie to shane you have pride in your in your history here in prairie to shane do you want to make a decision to, to destroy that history for another walmart for another shopping mall for another strip mall or do you want to take the economic hit and do something that's more viable like heritage tourism. And so I think that's the discussion that needs to be had. You basically, you can't say, you know, long-term big money for the community. You gotta say, you need to make a personal decision to what's important to you, your local history and versus your, your immediate dollars in your pocket. And if you make that appeal to a lot of folks in these communities, they'll make the right choice. I like the optimism. Um, and and I share your sentiment. Sometimes I wonder, though, if we're in the minority. You know, I I don't always know what uh, you know every person's take on stuff like that is. And I do agree that a lot of it does happen in education and um, helping people appreciate something that they may walk by all of the time and just not really consider deeply. And uh, sometimes we lose something before we really value it. So we, we hate to learn those lessons uh, the hard way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Michael, come on up. Yeah. So Ryan, Ryan was just echoing that, you know, thank you for that endorsement that we're hopeful that these modules will be the first, um, you know, steps into making it easier to get into classrooms and to help develop that appreciation uh, and, and value among the people who live in these communities. Thank you. Um, I, so I wanted to bring it back to, we're talking about education and the modules and uh, Rand, I wanted to address this to you as well as everyone else. So a lot of what the Heritage Corridor is about is getting the information about these wonderful resources to a larger population. We've talked about this, younger people, older people, and so on, so they can appreciate it, so they can embrace it. So this module is an important part of that. So now that we have this module, how do we shop it out to people? Because you know, right now, I mean, unless you're on the website or you're kind of stumbling around looking for French heritage, and that's fine, we'll be there and we could serve those people's needs. But how do we become a bit more proactive in getting that? I know you work with teachers uh, widely, and um, you know the question is how do we how do we advertise it, promote it, distribute it so that more people know about it instead of it just being our well kept secret? Yeah, come on, Rand is coming. We don't have to. Sorry, <laughs> the box is gone. So I, I'll I'll speak I'll speak briefly. That's an excellent point. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that I would like to know more about is how to reach history teachers in particular. I think each state has a grade in which you do that state's history. Mine, I think, was fourth grade Iowa history. Um, and I still remember some of the things from it. Um, I have a cousin who was uh, a, a, an elementary teacher in Indiana, and she educated herself on some of the things in our, co our corner of the state. Um, and so working, I mean, this is, I think, Michael's point, too, is um, getting the information out to history teachers, to French teachers, and knowing what they need and what their possibilities are and their limitations are is very important. So there is another set of connections to be made. Um, we got a lot of work to do, right? We've got tourism, we've got economic, we've got local governments, but also when you can make connections with teachers and when you can help to facilitate development of materials that are that they can really use. Teachers are really, really busy folks. Um, and so when we can facilitate their jobs, that's that's a great thing. So really good point. Thank you, Michael. Um, the key to this is social media. Um, this is the link that connects your your uh, your website, your content material, and is your advertising in your draw system. Um, I know this because we designed a system like this for Wisconsin archaeology, and we've got uh, 12,000 members now um, of that online system that are checking and learning about Wisconsin archaeology every every day. I posted something on uh, was a Ojibwe learning about uh, tree modifications from their people uh, over the lunch hour. It's been seen by 2,000 people by now. So that's how you connect your advertising. Once you get of social media, TikTok, things like that. You need to get a younger intern staff who can handle this new technology because this, you know, what you're talking about, Facebook is basically a 30 to 55 platform. Younger than that, you've got other platforms. But if you want a multi-generational organization, if you want multiple generation fundraising, if you want to have a long trajectory of your organization, social media is the only way to go. The days of newsletters, and an invited lecture being your content, it's not going to get it done anymore. Probably right. <laughs> yes, Carol. Come on up, Carol. It's it's hard for our virtual people. They have too much uh, 
time where they have to rely on on me to relay the message and they're just sitting there. I want them to see you anyway. Come on up. Um, so I'm just saying that I think an, also an important tool, social media is a, a thing for a certain era mm -hmm. of a, a generation of folks. But if you're looking at kids and you're really looking to educate and let me tell you, kids drag people to historic sites. If they if they find an interest and they hear about it, they're going to ask their parent to go. We see it all the time uh, with our work with schools in our area and in the libraries that we reach out to. So by including this link in the corridor in our education materials that we send to uh, the schools ahead of our, say, our education day, where we send a haversack that has all the different items, select items that were used of in the 1750s era. Um, uh, and, uh, and the teachers tell us, and we send some um, study plans, and if we include this link with it, we're now, believe me, the teachers are gonna love it so they can show all the Mississippi River and show up and down uh, uh, the, the, the whole course of the river and the history that, the French history that's connected to that. I've had um, different people within the state in different agencies when we've done certain things who grew up in the area and they said, you know, we never studied this history in school and they're very excited by the things we have done just trying to promote through our site, um, our connection with our, our schools and our libraries and are very supportive of it. But it's just a, so by us taking this home with us and putting it in all our materials mm -hmm. as well as on site and online, which are very important, um, but also make sure you're getting it in your educational materials that you're handing out. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, in our in, in the state of all uh, in our region, it's uh, our education day is geared, I believe, is fourth to fifth graders. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the 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 target. target that we aim for, and they're very engaged when they come through. They ask, and because these teachers are pre, they'll do study plans ahead of time. The kids are great when they come in, they ask great questions, mm -hmm. very engaged. So thank you for that, Carol. And, you know, on top of it, the Randolph County community uh, commissioners, their, their uh, social media and the social media generated out of your community is fantastic. And I think that's another outlet kind of per what Ryan offered. And I think, uh, you know, all of those kinds of, you know, platforms can be used and, and disseminated. Come on. Thank you. Just, just maybe to try to, to contribute to address this question. <laughs> um, I, I tried to, to hint at it during uh, the remarks. I made. Uh, sorry, yes, <laughs> that, like an American with the mic. It's in that because then the virtual is going here. Okay. You just have to go for it. I'll do my best. You sure. Um, just to try to, um, I, I tried to hint at it uh, when, when I when I uh, did my remarks. But we, we have here an uh, interesting network of people who are uh, uh, who, who should be interested in 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 uh, in getting some more uh, material uh, about this. Uh, first, these uh, immersion schools we mentioned. So we mentioned the one in uh, in Milwaukee, uh, 45 years. But we have we have others uh, in in Minneapolis. Uh, at least four of them. Uh, we have uh, in this network uh, as well um, schools for uh, for American people from French ascent to studying French on Saturday mornings. Uh, I'm sure they would be interested. We have a tremendous network of Alliance Francaise. It's uh, 22 Alliance Francaise uh, here in the Midwest. So not all of them uh, are uh, giving French lessons, but a lot of them uh, are. Uh, at I think all these, uh, and we have the accredited school, uh, so by the French Ministry of Education, it's uh, four uh, in the Midwest, two in Chicago, one in Detroit, one in uh, Minneapolis as well. Uh, I think all uh, these schools are partners uh, to which we could reach out to propose this, uh, these modules. And I want to, uh, to touch uh, upon as well um, the local uh, American schools, because uh, not all of them are very uh, usual interlocutors, but uh, many of them are interlocutors. Uh, so based, be, being based in Chicago, we know a lot uh, CPS, Chicago Public Schools. Uh, they have uh, French programs, so we can definitely engage with them because they are partners. But uh, as I said uh, earlier, 
we would be happy to help uh, you in engaging uh, with uh, local authority responsible for uh, curriculums uh, to discuss this, to promote this, because uh, again, I think the work which has been done is, uh, is amazing and, uh, and we're uh, uh, very much determined to make it known uh, as much as we can. Thank you. Merci. And those are, those are great, great things to know. Um, and, you know, it goes beyond just learning about French and using the French language. There are the applications of history and, and targeting which states are, uh, you know, which years each state is targeting for their state's history. Not to mention, you know, as we go up, there's always, uh, even at the college level and high school level, how about like AP geography and, you know, all kinds of things. So whether you're a Francophile or not, it shouldn't really matter. There's all kinds of, of ways to access this information and why it would be, you know, uh, important. Um, I thought I saw a uh, hand, yes. But is it possible to come up here and share? Because I think that's the best, but wait till you get here because our virtual listeners can't hear you yet. Yeah, I'll do some stalling while you come up. Um, and I liked Connie's uh, comment. She wants to uh, develop a, a video game, create a French Explorer video game in which they follow the true trajectory. Trajectory, trajectory. Come on up. Uh, building on what Carol was Hold saying. Hold on, Susan. And no. Superintendent of Effigy Mounds National Monument. And yeah, building on what Carol was saying for her, that they already have educational curriculum developed for their site. But I think that's the natural next step for this is to um, each state look at their K through 12 requirements. And instead of just guiding a teacher to the site, which then means that they have to develop things, um, use some of the grant money that you have given for restoration of buildings or preservation to help each state to develop um, usually it's there's usually like two levels there's an elementary level like a fourth grade and then there's usually a middle or high school level get that curriculum developed so that the teacher just doesn't go to the website and look and see what they can pull but they actually can go in there and and their lesson plans are there ready for them that are aligned with they don't have much time to move outside of the required curriculum anymore they they have to keep on schedule so get all that um, developed and ready for them to just download and utilize, and if they're lucky enough to be close to one of these sites that they can then take a field trip, that's great. Um, if not, they have this already. I, um, I think that'd be a great use of grant money to move this project forward. Susan, don't go anywhere. <laughs> so you seem to know what you're talking about. Uh, and I, I'm gonna kind of keep this little uh, strand going here. So you're saying that, and it makes total sense that teachers, and we've heard this time and time again, that they really do have a strict kind of bunch of guidelines that they're adhering to, they're busy, they don't even have the time sometimes to take a look and at this. And flexibility and flexibility. Yeah. So I hear what you're saying. We need to, in some ways, maybe target a higher level. The question is, are you experienced um, in what that entails? To... I mean, the National Park Service does that all the time. They mm -hmm. They um, develop curriculum based on the state that they're located in. Um, we have downloadable curriculum uh, on our website. Um, a lot of other national parks do too, that, that directly tailors it to, um, so that it can fit in to that, it, whether it's you know Iowa history or, or Minnesota history or whatever it is that, that they can tailor right well, into Well, I, I think that Randa um, has, done that with the modules and in, in terms of uh, identifying, you know, crucial um, criterion that must be met to, well, I, but I'm, the question I'm, is how then do you get the, you know, at that state level or at that. And then you need to, then you got to do a little bit of your ambassadors got to get out there and let the schools know that they're available, that is available. But I would also suggest that it's not just like putting down which standards are met, but it's like saying, here's an activity mm -hmm. that you can do. I mean, you can, we got you know, it. Check. Yeah. yeah so. Okay, so the I, I'm still going to push this just okay. a tiny bit more. Uh, you were saying that, so we have all of this. How do we get it in front of the right people who are the decision policy makers, and what does that entail? Are you, uh, you know, being from a national parks, you have a certain experience doing something like this? It's just exactly what Carol talked 
but it's not any different. It's it's going to your school districts. Mm -hmm. It's letting them know that the curriculum is available. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's yeah. There's no one size fits all. It's all of the things that have been mentioned here. It's all the social media. Yeah. It's the field trips. It's the individual. Oh, it's it's individual. Um, yeah, getting it's being out in your community and knowing your schools, going to your public schools, to your private schools, to your charter schools. Um, well, that's really helpful. Thank you, Susan. And what I would say is that part of um, the support that we receive from the William T. Kemper Foundation to uh, uh, has been uh, really to address these modules. And uh, okay. that is a very good point going forward. How do we get this out? And part of it um, is that, yes, we need to start you know, as a collective identifying as, as Yannick has and as Susan has certain decision-making levels and going there. So that is something that I do hope to do. Um, and, uh, you know, I wanna come to Minneapolis. I want to uh, maybe come to uh, Milwaukee. You know, these are, are key places that have uh, those kinds of programs in place that might be a good starting point. Sometimes you just need a couple that say, yeah, that's a good idea, we're gonna implement it. And then others say, okay, that seems to make sense. And then it, it, you know, it, it goes from there. So uh, these are the kinds of things that yes, uh, some of the support will allow us to, to continue to develop that and uh, work with decision makers and hopefully get that, get that in there. Um, what else can we say? Uh, yes, hands are up. You want to come back here, Greg? Okay. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So the point was made that it's just reiterating that social media is really a relatively inexpensive but effective way to. Yes, and that is something that Front Heritage Quarters discussed. But uh, another thing uh, through Front Heritage Society, there is a social media uh, platform in place for not only French Heritage Society as a, as a whole, but also for the Chicago Midwest chapter. We do have Instagram as well as Facebook. So those, those things are in place and uh, in fact, I noticed that uh, when I was looking at the metrics, we had, I think, uh, about 1,600 um, hits on when we publicized this event on the uh, Facebook page for our chapter. So that, that was pretty significant. So, um, you know, for what it's worth, that is something that we are, are doing. And I think a uh, point taken that that's something we should probably continue to develop. Um, so listen, it's it's 424. We've had a great day, uh, <laughs> but we've got a boat to catch. And <laughs> so I just wanna wrap things up. It really has been a full, full day. It's been wonderful. We've accomplished a lot. We're really proud and we're so happy to have shared the, the day with you. And um, we hope that this will compel you to consider becoming a member, a more active player, to uh, reflect upon what we talked about and presented today and go back to your communities and you know keep this going because uh, we, we are you know in the canoe and we are off. So everybody, thank you very much. Merci. A, uh, until next year's conference, we'll have to make our, our announcement where that's going to be but we're not prepared to do that today. So thank you and signing off.